Good morning and welcome to the City Council's 10th day of hearings on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2019. My name is Daniel Drum and I chair the Finance Committee. We are joined by the Committee on Education, chaired by my colleague, Councilmember Mark Traeger, and we have been joined by my colleagues, Councilmember Steve Matteo, Councilmember Adrian Adams, and I think we will be joined by others later on. Uh, today we'll hear from the Department of Education and the School Construction Authority. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the Finance Division staff for putting this hearing together, including the Director, Latanya McKenney, Deputy Directors, Regina Pareda Ryan and Nathan Toth, the, council, the Committee Council, Rebecca Chasen, Unit Head, Doheny Sampura, Finance Analyst, Liz Hoffman and Caitlin O'Hagan, and uh, the Finance Division Administrative Support Unit, Nicole Anderson, Maria Pagan and Roberta Catarano, who pull everything together. I'd also like to thank Evia Cardoso from my staff who has been with me at all the budget hearings. Thank you for your efforts as well. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that the public will be invited to testify on the last day of budget hearings on May 24th, beginning at approximately 4 p.m. in this room. For members of the public who wish to testify but cannot attend the hearing, you can email your testimony to the Finance Division at finance testimony at council.nyc.gov and the staff will make it a part of the official record. I'd like to start by welcoming our new schools chancellor, Richard Carranza. Thank you for being here with us today. This is the first uh, council hearing at which the new chancellor is testifying and we look forward to an open and productive relationship in discussing the DOE's budget programs and policies. Thank you also to the other representatives here to testify DOE Chief of Staff Ursulina Ramirez, DOE Chief Financial Officer Ray Orlando, and SCA President Lorraine Grillo. Today we will examine the DOE's fiscal 2019 executive budget, which totals $25.5 billion in expense funding, not including pensions and debt service. This is 29% of the city's entire budget. This significant level of funding is what supports over 1.1 million students across 1,800 K-12 schools, as well as a robust pre-K program and a new but growing early childhood education program. However, we must ensure that our education dollars are being spent efficiently and effectively. The Council's budget response called on the administration to direct education dollars to schools by increasing Fair Student Funding, or FSF. And I really want to thank my co-chair for the hard work that he did all the way from Albany, starting in Albany, to actually working on it on the B&T with us and then actually getting it happen, to make it happen here at the, at the, at the City Council level and the, uh, with the administration. Uh, the funding will increase the FSF floor from 87% to 90% and increase the FSF average from 90% to 92.7%. As a result, over 850 schools currently receiving less than 90% of their F FSF allocation will see increased funding in fiscal 2019. While the Council applauds this investment in school budgets, there is more to be done. The Council's budget response called on the DOE to add a weight for students in temporary housing to the FSF formula so schools can appropriately support these students. The executive budget does not include $11.9 million for DOE students in shelter programs, but this program only reaches, oh, it does, excuse me, it does include $11.9 million for DOE students in shelter programs, but this program only reaches 100 schools. Moreover, as in the past years, this funding is not baseline and is included in fiscal 2019 only. While we understand the need to evaluate and refine programming, it's baffling that moving into its third year, the administration is unwilling to baseline this funding. In addition, the Council's budget response called on the administration to phase in funding for FSF so that all schools would be receiving 100% of their FSF allocation by 2021. However, the funding added will only maintain the floor at 90% and the average at 92.7%. The administration has continuously said that they are waiting on the state to fulfill their campaign for fiscal equity or CFE obligation in order to increase FSF. The Council agrees that the state owes our students much more than they're getting and continues to advocate in Albany for this funding. However, the city cannot and should not wait on the state to adequately fund our schools. In that same vein, the city should more realistically project state education revenues. The executive budget continues to project 4.3% year-over-year growth in state education aid, even though this year DOE received 3.3% 
and last year DOE received only 2.4% in increases. The Council wants to adopt a budget that will realistically forecast the state revenues and city spending. Today we will examine the DOE's capital budget and capital commitment plan, as well as the February 2018 proposed amendment to the fiscal 2015 to 19 five-year capital plan, which includes $16.5 billion, which totals $16.5 billion. Before we begin, I'd like to remind my colleagues that the first round of questions for the uh, Department of Education will be limited to five minutes per council member. And if council members have additional questions, we will have a second round of questions at three minutes per council member. I will now turn the mic over to my co-chair, Council Member Traeger, for his statement, and then we'll hear testimony from the Chancellor of the Department of Education, Richard Carranza. Thank you, uh, Chair Drum, and thank you for your leadership. You, you have already made a significant impact in your role as finance chair. Good morning. I am Council Member Mark Traeger and chair of the Education Committee. Welcome to the fiscal 2019 executive budget hearing on the Department of Education and the School Construction Authority. I'd like to take a moment as well to personally welcome Chancellor uh, Richard Carranza. I very much look forward to working with you, uh, and I hope we can have a productive, cooperative relationship. And I just want to note for the record, when we met, I, I simply asked, visit as many schools as you can, and Mr. Chancellor, you have been nonstop all over the place, and we really, truly appreciate that. Um, the Department of Education's fiscal 2019 budget of $25.5 billion is $1.2 billion more than the fiscal 2018 adopted budget. This includes more than $191 million in new needs for fiscal uh, 2019. While I support many of these programs and new needs, I have concerns about DOE's priorities and some of the spending choices made in this budget. One of my primary concerns as chair of the Education Committee is ensuring schools have the funding they need to support and educate students. That is why uh, I traveled to Albany with the Speaker and, and Finance Chair Drum and my colleagues to advocate for increased state funding to support a fully funded fair student funding, uh, fair student formula. That is why I advocated to DOE to support this funding request even when state funding fell short of reaching this goal. A fully funded FSF formula enables schools to, to provide the complete range of educational programs students need. And I know this funding has the biggest impact on students and schools. With adequate funding, schools have real choices on how to best support their students. Social workers and guidance counselors can be hired. Additional support for vulnerable students to overcome barriers to learning can be provided. Enrichment programs in the arts and sciences can be offered. These services should not be a rarity in schools. These shouldn't be hard choices for principals. These programs and supportive services should be provided to every student in every school. Out of $191 million in new needs in the executive budget, only $1.2 million is being used to support 10 new Bridging the Gap social workers, and 10 more social workers simply isn't enough. We have more than 5,500 school safety agents. That's more than the number of social workers, guidance counselors, and school psychologists combined. We need to step back and listen to our students. Our students are asking us to add more social workers because increasing the emotional and social supports at schools is what really makes students feel safe. With $191 million in new spending, more of this money should be directed to school budgets, and more of this money should be used to hire social workers and guidance counselors to support our students' needs. According to DOE's own estimate, it would, it would only cost $5.2 million to add at least one full-time guidance counselor or social worker to the 41 schools that currently do not have one. In a budget of, of $25.5 billion and $191 million in new needs, $5.2 million to ensure every school has at least one full-time social worker or guidance counselor seems like an obvious choice to me. Why wasn't this added to the budget? Why won't DOE commit to providing every school with a dedicated social worker or guidance counselor to ensure we are meeting the social and emotional needs of all of our students. In a school system with 50, with 5,511 full-time school safety agents and only 4,173 full-time social workers and guidance counselors, I think we need to be doing more to increase counseling services in schools 
and we need to hire more social workers and, and, and guidance counselors. That is why I have real concerns about DOE's priorities and spending choices, and I'd like to have answers today. And this brings me to the next point about accountability. At our preliminary budget hearing in March, I opened the hearing by saying that as a council, we are looking for accountability from each city agency. At that time, we had many outstanding questions DOE had not answered, and the agency was not being accountable to the council. Unfortunately, I'm here again telling you that DOE is not being accountable. We received DOE's responses to our follow-up letter from our, our prelim budget hearing yesterday, less than 24 hours before our executive budget hearing, and almost six weeks after it was sent to DOE. This is not acceptable. The Council's role in overseeing the Department of Education, including the spending choices made by this administration, need to be taken serious, seriously. DOE's budget represents 29% of the city's budget, and we need answers to our questions in an appropriate time frame in order to adopt the budget. Going forward, we expect the DOE to do better. I'd like to also take a moment to reemphasize the need for paid parental leave. If we want our students to learn in the best and most supportive environment possible, we need to make sure we're providing basic accommodations for teachers, school leaders, and support staff. School staff deserve to be treated with dignity, but right now our teachers, who are overwhelmingly women, are being denied paid parental leave. In New York City, our educators have to use their sick days to take time off to bond with their child. Do we, as a city, realize what we are saying when we force women to use sick days for maternity leave. The city of New York is effectively saying that pregnancy is a sickness, and that is absolutely unacceptable. Paid parental leave should be a right for all of our school staff. This is a way to uplift our schools, our students, our families, and our city. We also need to do more as a city to fully integrate our schools. Segregation is a problem in New York City. It is real. We need to address segregation in all its forms. Our schools are racially segregated. Our schools are also segregated, segregated by English language learners. One school may have hundreds of English language learners and the school down the block may have none. And many of our schools are not accessible to our students. I have no fully accessible schools in my district, zero. What kind of message are we sending families when we say that this school is not for you? We must address all forms of segregation in our schools. At today's hearing, we'll also hear from the School Construction Authority the council's budget response called for additional investment in accessibility and school security in fiscal year 2019. We are disappointed that there are no plans to reallocate funding for these council priorities in the coming fiscal year. The council's preliminary budget response also called for the administration to implement the recommendations of the planning to learn report. We had a productive hearing to discuss the, the, this report last month and look forward to continue working with the DOE, SCA, and other city agencies to implement these recommendations. I'd like to echo uh, the chair, uh, chair Drum's thanks to the Finance Division for their work in preparing for this hearing. I'd like to also thank the Education Committee staff, uh, our new Education Committee Council, Beth Golub, uh, Jan Atwell, Kalima Johnson, and uh, Millie Bonilla. Finally, I'd like to also thank my staff, Anna Scaife, Vanessa Ogle, uh, and Eric Feinberg. I will now turn back the hearing to Chair Drum. Thank you very much, and uh, we have been joined by Councilmember Holden, Councilmember Grudenchik, Councilmember Rose, Councilmember Levine, Councilmember Amphrey Samuel, and Councilmember Powers. And I'm going to ask my council now to swear uh, the chancellor in. Let's, swear, let's do the whole panel, to swear the whole panel in. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Yes, I do. Okay, Chancellor, whenever you're ready. So good morning, buenos dias, Chairs Drum and Traeger. It's good to have two educators in chairmanship positions, so school is in session. And I also want to welcome and thank all of the members of the Finance and Education Committee that are here today. It is my pleasure to appear before the City Council for the first time today and to testify on Mayor de Blasio's fiscal year 2019 executive expense budget for the New York City Public Schools. Joining me this morning are Ursulina Ramirez, DOE Chief Operating Officer, Ray Orlando, DOE Chief Financial Officer, and Lorraine Grillo, President and CEO of the New York City Construction Authority, who will also discuss the capital plan for our schools following my comments. I would like to begin by thanking Speaker Johnson, Chairs Drum and Traeger, 
and all of the members of the City Council for your leadership, advocacy, and support of New York City's 1.1 million students in our school communities. I have had the opportunity to work in several urban school districts across the country and work with many elected officials in different municipalities. And New York City elected officials' knowledge and support of their schools is incredibly unique. I would say supremely unique. Just a few weeks ago, I was proud to stand with the mayor, Speaker Johnson, both chairs Drum and Traeger, and many council members to announce the unprecedented $125 million increase to school budgets. I know that the DOE has had a long-standing partnership with the City Council and I'm committed to continuing this collaboration with the City Council in the months and years ahead. Since this is my first time appearing before the Council, I would like to tell you a little bit about myself, my career, and why I believe in the power of traditional public education. I am the son of a sheet metal worker and a hairdresser and the grandson of Mexican immigrants. I grew up in a Spanish-speaking home in Tucson, Arizona. Like so many New York students, my parents spoke another language at home, and I didn't learn English until I entered the public schools in Tucson in kindergarten. Although my parents never attended college, they knew that the path forward for my twin brother and I included an education, a strong education. They wanted more for their children, a pathway to college and career, like many New Yorkers I have met. My parents were right. Public education is the greatest gift I have ever received, and many years ago, I decided to devote my life to it. I started teaching nearly 30 years ago in the same public high school that I attended. I began as a bilingual social studies and music teacher, and later became a high school principal in both Tucson and Las Vegas. I then went on to be a regional superintendent in Las Vegas and the superintendent of schools in San Francisco and most recently in Houston. This is my eighth week as a New York City Schools Chancellor, and I've spent my first month on a whirlwind listening tour visiting schools in all five boroughs, where I've heard directly from students and from parents, educators, administrators, and support staff. I've also met with elected officials and heard about their needs and concerns. In all, I have visited more than 30 schools and hosted more than 4,000 students, parents, and employees at 21 town halls as part of the listening tour. What an incredible way to get the pulse of this city, this vibrant, diverse city, and the nation's largest school system. In total, since I have arrived in the city, I have visited over 55 schools. I need to update that because of yesterday. I have now visited 57 schools. And I'm proud to be living my, by my motto, which is a chancellor in the field is worth three in the seat back at Tweed. <laughs> Among the highlights of my tour were visits to a 3K and pre-K uh, for all class in the Bronx with students who were learning about plants. I also visited dual language, Spanish, and band classes in Brooklyn, an aviation program in Queens, a community school and computer science fair in Manhattan, a future teacher's academy on Staten Island. Amongst many of my visits and throughout my visits, I've been struck by our educators' commitment to their students, their passion for professional growth, and their willingness to make their classrooms laboratories, not just for academic excellence, but also for social justice. Most of all, I've been struck by our amazing students and families. At the town halls that I've hosted, I've got the best question, quite frankly, from my students. It's clear that they are informed about our school system and the types of services they need to succeed. Parents did not hold back either, sharing their hopes for their children's education with me. Across boroughs, it, all, it is also clear that students, parents, and educators believe in the city's equity and excellence for all vision and want more. They want more 3K for all. They want more universal literacy in their communities. They want more computer science education and AP classes, more arts, more bilingual programs, and career and technical education programs. They want more social-emotional supports. These are profound investments in our children's future and in the future of this great city. My key takeaways are that our schools are doing a lot of things right, and our stakeholders and the people we serve are aware of the tremendous progress that we've made. But it is also clear to me that we have lots of work to do. As chancellor, I'm diving headfirst into the work of equity and excellence for all, and you're gonna hear me speak a lot about key themes. You're gonna hear me speak a lot about social justice, 
You're going to hear me speak a lot about creating positive environments for students and educators. You're going to hear me speak about lifting up all children and empowering, not just engaging, our parents. The administration's equity and excellence agenda for all embodies these principles by focusing on putting every child on the path to college and careers. We are building a strong foundation for early, for early learning with our 3K and pre-K, our universal literacy initiatives, and algebra for all. We are expanding access to rigorous and college-aligned courses with AP for all and computer science for all. And we are providing more support to our students along the way with college access for all, our single shepherd program, and community and renewal schools. The New York City public schools are making real progress. Since establishing equity and ex excellence for all, our graduation rate has climbed to 74.3%, the highest it's ever been, while our dropout rate at 7.8% is the lowest it's ever been. New York City students also outperformed the rest of the state in our English language arts exams for the second year in a row, and our overall improvement outpaced the rest of the state in both ELA and math. Additionally, a record number of our students are taking and passing AP exams and are ready to attend college. I am eager to build on this success. I want to speak briefly about some new investments in the FY 2019 executive budget that are going to do just that. The executive budget of approximately $32.3 billion includes $25.5 billion in operating funds and another $6.7 billion in education-related pension and debt service funds. Our funding is a combination of city, state, and federal dollars, with city tax levy dollars making up the largest share at 57%. State dollars are at 37%, and federal dollars are at 6%. Through the executive budget, we are doubling down on our commitment to early childhood education, which is a game changer. The budget includes funding to speed up the rollout of 3K for all. We are bringing the city's 3K commitment to approximately 19,000 seats in 12 districts by the fall of 2021, which is up from 15,000 seats in eight districts in our original plan. We are also investing an additional 30.5 million in our Universal Literacy Initiative, which will expand to every community school district this fall. Specifically, as a result of this invest investment, we'll add more coaching at the highest need schools, more targeted training to support English language learners, and we'll double the number of after school reading programs for children in shelters. Early literacy is one of the best investments we can make, and more of our children reading on grade level today means more young adults succeeding in middle school, high school, and as the New Yorkers of tomorrow. The mayor's budget increases funding to 11.9 million to support schools with a high concentration of students in shelters, including 10 additional social workers in schools serving this population. Our 62 schools with some of the highest population of students in shelters will also continue to receive health and mental health support services. And all students in shelters will continue to receive targeted enrollment supports. We are also investing $24 million in an unprecedented multi-year health education initiative modeled on PE Works, which will revitalize health education citywide. We will focus on teacher training and support so that teachers are prepared to provide age-appropriate, medically accurate, and inclusive instruction. We will significantly increase so school wellness councils to engage schools, families, communities, and partners. We will create a model health education schools. We will create model health education schools that meet state requirements and establish best practices for instruction, family engagement, and connection with health services. As a former social studies teacher and a social studies teacher at heart, I'm particularly excited that the budget includes funding for our new Civics for All initiative. Yesterday, in fact, we held our first ever citywide student voter registration day with the support of the council and other key partners. And I'm also very excited to say that I was registered to vote yesterday by students for the city of New York. I have to add a little editorial. I've been asked, what did you register? What party did you register for? And again, I'm not going to publicly disclose that, but I will tell you my favorite color is blue. 
I want to thank those of you who participated yesterday, and I look forward to your continued support as we strengthen civic education across our schools, including new civics education curricula, a new participatory budgeting program where high school students will work together to decide how their schools should spend $2,000 each year. Finally, I'd like to highlight two new investments that are essential to the long-term success of our equity and excellence for all agenda. The first is an investment in implicit bias training and culturally responsive training over the next four years. Culturally responsive training meets our students and families where they are and tailors the way we teach and serve our kids to their unique backgrounds and experiences that they bring into our classrooms. We know from experience that teacher training is one of the best investments we can make. If we can better tailor our teaching to the communities we serve, we can improve instruction and outcomes across the board in our city. This, the second is a $125 million annual commitment to ensure that all schools receive at least 90% fair student funding beginning next school year. As a result, over 800 schools will see increased funding in 2019. More funding means more teachers, guidance counselors, and social workers in school. In fact, as I've talked to principals following this announcement, principals have talked about adding social workers and adding teacher positions and creating enrichment programs. As a Manhattan principal also succinctly said to me, when you're a principal, every dollar counts. Every one of these 20, $125 million counts for our kids, our families, and our schools. And I would again like to thank the City Council for your advocacy and for helping us make this a reality. We are committed to reaching 100% for all schools, but we can only achieve this goal if the state keeps its commitment to fulfill the campaign for fiscal equity settlement. I pledge to ride any vehicle, ride any bus, and stand shoulder to shoulder with any council member or elected official in Albany to make this case. In this school year alone, New York City public school students have been shortchanged $1.6 billion in state education funds. This is unacceptable. I look forward to discussing these new investments as well as our continuing work towards equity and excellence for all with the members here today and into the future. Let's have the tough conversations. Let's talk about school safety, about school segregation and integration, about school climates that support all students, including LGBTQ students, about serving our English language learner students and students with disabilities, about serving our students in temporary housing, about turning around our historically underserved schools. As a parent and as a man of color, as a former teacher and as a principal, I have always believed that the high quality education is the great equalizer in our society. A great traditional public education is not only the cornerstone of our democracy, it is also the best way to empower the next generation. I am aware that it will take hard work to continue to move our school system forward, but I also know that thanks to your efforts and those of our educators, our students, our families, our school communities, our, our workers, we are building on a strong foundation. New York City's public schools are a model for the nation. All eyes are on us, and our innovative approach to equity and excellence is at the forefront. It is my honor to serve in this vibrant, diverse, progressive city and to work alongside each of you as we seek answers to the city's most pressing educational challenges. I am confident that together we will help all of our students achieve their full potential. I want to thank you again for this opportunity, and at this point, I would like to turn it over to Lorraine Grillo, who will update the committee on the capital plan. We will then be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Chancellor. Good morning, Chair Drum and Chair Traeger, and members of the Finance and Education Committees. My name is Lorraine Grillo, and I'm President and CEO of the New York City School Construction Authority. I'm pleased to be here today to discuss the proposed F February 2018 amendment to the FY 2015 to 19 five-year capital plan and the changes to our capital plan as a result of the mayor's executive budget released on April 26th. I'm continually grateful to the city council for its support and generous funding for our schools. 
The collaboration we've had is truly critical to our success, and I look forward to continuing our great work together for all of our students. Since the preliminary budget hearing in March, we have seen some positive changes, including additional funding for our capital improvement program, as well as an increase in the number of cited seats. Our capital investment program has increased by $130.5 million, which includes an additional $125 million in FY 2019 for the air conditioning initiative. I'm also happy to report that we were able to increase the number of Queens High School seats by almost 2,000 since the publication of the February 2018 amendment. The Panel for Educational Policy approved the February 2018 proposed amendment on April 25th. I would like to take a moment to briefly talk about the highlights in the amendment, which the Council will be voting on to approve at, at the adoption of the 2019 budget. The capacity program. The proposed 2018 amendment includes $6.5 billion for the capacity program, an increase of over $500 million from the 2017 adopted budget. Our capacity program consists of four categories, new capacity, pre-kindergarten initiative, class size reduction, and facility replacement. Of the $6.5 billion allocated to capacity, $4.8 billion is dedicated to creating more than 44,000 new seats through an estimated 88 projects within school districts experiencing the most critical existing and projected overcrowding. The amendment identifies the total need of approximately 83,000 seats. Since our February amendment, we have identified nearly 8,000 additional seats which will bring us to nearly 40,000 total cited seats. Included in our capacity program is $872 million for the city's pre-K for all initiative, an increase of approximately $70 million from the 2017 adopted budget, which will create almost 8,800 new seats across the city. In addition, $287 million has been allocated to the replacement program. This represents an increase of $145 million. Finally, $490 million is allocated in our class size reduction program to build additions or new buildings near schools that would significantly benefit from additional capacity. This program recognizes the need for targeted investments in areas of the city that may be geographically isolated and have unfunded seat needs. I'm happy to report we have moved into feasibility for three additional sites, one in District 27, one in District 29, and one in District 31. The plan amendment directs $6.7 billion for capital investment. Nearly 75% or 4.1 billion will address the buildings identified in our annual building survey as most in need of repairs, such as roof and structural work, safeguarding our buildings against water infiltration and other facility projects. The capital investment category also includes funding for upgrades to fire alarms, public address systems, and removal of transportable classroom units. More specifically, $395 million has been allocated to remove TCUs and redevelop the yard space where the TCUs had been located. To date, we have removed 171 TCUs and have developed plans to remove 84 more, leaving a remaining balance of 99 TCUs not yet slated for removal. It's important to note that the removal schedule is contingent upon capacity constraints within the area and input of local school communities. Also included in our capital improvement program is worse work to enhance school accessibility. Working in collaboration with the New York City Department of Education, we have completed or in the process of completing 30 projects in 28 buildings across the city, positively impacting over 31,000 students. 
Currently, over 940 buildings in our system are either fully or partially accessible. Over 25% or $1.7 billion will go towards school enhancement projects. The two main programs in this category are facility enhancements and technology. Included in our capital investment program is funding to support our citywide effort to ensure air conditioning in all classrooms. In order to complete this work by 2022 and provide thousands of students with more, a more comfortable learning environment, the capital plan allocates $175 million in funding to support this initiative. As I've previously mentioned, the city has added an additional $125 million in FY19 to our capital plan for these electrical upgrades. The mandated programs category with $3.4 billion allocated includes approximately $750 million for boiler conversions in approximately 110 buildings cu currently using number four oil. The remaining funds are assigned to co cover other required costs, including insurance and completion of projects from our prior plan. Additionally, our work to remove and replace all PCB-containing lighting fixtures was completed under this funding. In conclusion, we understand that the public school system as a whole continues to experience pockets of overcrowding, and we are working to address these concerns through new school construction. We remain focused on remedying these issues and will continue to rely on your feedback and support as we do so. Our annual capital planning process has already benefited significantly from your input, and our students have benefited from your generous support of capital projects. With continued collaboration and tens of thousands of seats slated to come online over the next five to seven years, we remain confident that the expansion and enhancement of school buildings across the five boroughs will improve the educational experience for the city's 1.1 million school children, as well as the teachers and staff who serve them. Thank you again for allowing me to testify today, and we would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, President Grillo, and thank you, Chancellor, uh, for your testimony as well. Uh, I'm particularly grateful to you, Chancellor, for your willingness to put issues that sometimes there might have been a hesitancy to talk about in the past, and uh, specifically saying the words segregation, integration, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, these are issues that are out there, and the only way that we can confront them is by actually using the words necessary to talk about them. And so we're grateful to you for that, uh, that openness. Uh, it's a real breath of fresh air, and we look forward to continuing to work with you on those issues. Um, I'm just curious to know, what have you identified as your top challenges moving forward, and what's your assessment of the adequacy of the overall budget to help you meet those challenges moving forward? Thank you, Chairman Drum. Uh, so eight weeks into the role, I'm um, doing a lot of looking and listening. I would say that uh, there's some really good news and there's some, I, I would say, some challenges that, that I'm starting to notice. Obviously, one of the, the biggest challenges or I would say opportunities that we have is President Grillo just mentioned that. I will say that we have a portfolio of historic facilities, which is a very diplomatic way of saying we have some old buildings. Uh, and they present some challenges for us, in, not only in terms of uh, how we maintain and how we upkeep, but how we plan for programming in those buildings. Uh, you add to that the complexities around the air conditioning and the, the livability in those buildings, and then add to that as well then how we maintain them, and then add a third layer, which is how do we ensure connectivity for uh, computers and, and internet. So it's a big portfolio. I, I think that's one of the opportunities that going forward we will have to actually move the ball in a very, very strategic way around uh, those facilities. Uh, I think also we're a big system. So uh, while, while I think it's a, it's a good notion to have a decentralized approach at how you program uh, what happens in schools, I also think there has to be a conversation about 
what are some unifying threads of work system-wide? Because we know that we're not a confederation of independent schools, back to our social studies days. We're not a confederation of independent schools that geographically happen to exist in the same place. We're a, un a unified, intact school district. So there are things that should drive what we do in our district. So when I talk about social justice, you can only achieve social justice if you're meeting the needs of different communities, not from an equally based perspective, but from an equity based perspective. So understanding that different communities have different needs, we must be able to allocate resources and put support systems in place to enable systems to improve and communities to shine. Uh, that will be, uh, I, will, I will tell you right now, an organizing principle as how we go forward in terms of our budget priorities and our strategic priorities as well. Uh, the third thing that I would say that is really, really an opportunity for us are some of the big social um, societal conversations. And I thank you for your words of encouragement and your words of support. I think that we have to be uh, in the city of New York, which is one of the most diverse cities, cities not in America, but the world, where we have uh, the diversity of, uh, we, we are America in just a few years from now. It's New York City. We have to talk about every single opportunity that students have to access our traditional public schools without barriers. That means it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, we need to make those opportunities available to all of our students. And as I take a deep look at what we do, there are some perhaps uh, policies, there are some practices that we need to have a conversation. Are these truly giving all students the opportunity to access the wonderful public schools that we have uh, in New York City? That being said, I have to tell you, this is my fifth state now and the fifth school system that I've been able to uh, live and work in. I feel like I am a kid in Disneyland. Uh, there is no other municipality in this country that supports its traditional public schools like the city of New York does. Mm -hmm. The issue of investing in community schools, the issue of investing in implicit bias training, the investing in homeless students, as much more as we want to do, I will tell you there is no other large urban system that is investing in its students, its communities, and its children more than New York City. So I, I am absolutely just uh, euphoric with the ability to actually move these types of programs, these types of approaches in a very enlightened and I would say progressive way that will truly make a difference for our schools and our historically underserved communities. Uh, my observations so far are that we uh, have a lot of work to do, but that we have a great underpinning in terms of uh, the not only philosophical alignment, but the city's commitment to its traditional public schools. And that gives me great hope and, and great energy as we go forward. Chancellor, there's a number of long-standing issues here in the city of New York, like uh, poor student performance in certain areas, low parental engagement, high staff turno turnover, and subpar student um, attendance rates. Are those going to be part of your focus moving forward? Ch Chairman Drum, they absolutely will be part of our agenda and, and actually have been part of the agenda. What we want to do, and uh, I'm very grateful to Chancellor Farinha and the work that she brought uh, to really highlight the professionalism of our organization. Uh, I want to take that mantle and continue to run and perhaps run a little faster with that. I think it's critically important that uh, as we think about schools and the need to improve schools and the performance of schools, uh, what I've been talking in our communities in my listening tour and as I've been able to explain to people where I come from, we often start when we talk about schools at a point of accountability. How are you accountable? We rarely talk about how are we building capacity to meet the needs in the communities. So for example, if you are working in a community that, and because you live in a large urban environment, uh, suffer from the ills of large urban cities. So it can be intergenerational poverty. It could be homelessness. It could be intergenerational incarceration, uh, food insecurity, you name it. The ills of society and you have a concentrated place where that is happening, you can't treat those schools equally. Everybody gets the same. By definition, you must treat them equitably. 
And that begins by assessing what are the challenges and then how do we allocate resources not to lower the bar, but to empower and to build and to support communities to actually reach the bar that we've set for college and career readiness. You can only do that by building capacity in the teachers. So strong professional development, culturally relevant pedagogy, systems and structures that support continuous improvement. You have to look at how the strength of the leadership in the school is aligned to the needs of the community. And then you have to fund uh, an ability for schools not to become test prep factories, but to actually broaden the experience of students so that they have experiences in the arts, that they can draw, they can dance, they can express uh, who they are as human beings. Uh, so that equity investment is going to mean that there are going to be resources that will be prioritized from an equity perspective in communities that have historically been underserved. Now, I purposely use the term historically underserved because I refuse to use the term failing schools or schools that are underperforming because I have never in my almost 30 years as an educator ever met a community that consciously decides I'm going to fail school, I'm going to fail students today. I've never seen it. What I have seen is underfunding of schools. What I have seen is our systems and structures that create dis disincentives for students to attend those schools. What I have seen is policy that perhaps unintended consequences become that we disincentivize communities to go to their own local schools. So as we look at our systems and our structures and our policies and how we fund our schools, the things that you have talked about, Chairman, are going to be first and foremost. How are we not only providing support for our students and communities, part of our community schools objective, how are we providing an early start for our students to have a great beginning for educating, that's our 3K pre-K, how are we going to invest in students' understanding and parents empowered with knowledge to know how their children are going to go forward to a post-secondary experience, whether that's career or college, that's our College for All initiative. And then more importantly, how are we then going to provide tools for our educators, our principals, our support staff to meet the students and communities where they are, our implicit bias training, our culturally relevant pedagogy training. And then quite frankly, yours truly is going to be a loud, very upfront spokesperson for historically underserved communities, our LGBTQ community, the most endangered student group in any school district in America is our LGBTQ students. We have a responsibility to serve those students and provide them with the social emotional learning needs and the support systems to be successful. As a former English language learner student, yo también quiero asegurar que nuestros estudiantes aprendiendo inglés tienen sus apoyos. By the way, if you didn't speak Spanish, welcome to what it feels like to be an English language learner. Mm -hmm. You don't know the language, that's all. So I want to make sure that every student group and this organization is, is serving those student groups. So the very issues that you've identified, my experience has been that when you are very clear about the investment, you're very clear about the monitoring, you're very clear about the alignment of the system, that teacher retention goes up student achievement goes up, and not just measured by test scores, but by holistic measures, uh, and that communities actually revitalize around their schools. That's been my experience, uh, and I hope to work with my colleagues uh, in our system and with our elected officials to make that a reality in every community in the New York City public schools. I think one of the, I think one of the hallmarks of Chancellor Farina was her emphasis on collaboration as well. And that particularly um, affects professional development. I know that as a teacher, I would be hesitant to um, collaborate or share ideas with teachers if I thought it was going to be a competitive environment. There would be no incentive for me to want to do that, to give other ideas to teachers if it was, in fact, competitive. So I'm, I'm glad to hear a number of the programs that you're uh, talking about. Can you tell us how much will be spent this year on professional development? I. Let me see if I can find that number. Uh, I know it's a significant investment, including the investments that uh, I've just spoken about in terms of culturally relevant pedagogy and implicit bias training. 
Uh, I know that in our conversations with UFT initially, uh, we are on the same page in terms of investing in our educators. As I've spoken with our uh, administrators as well, we're on the same page about professional development for our principals. So uh, if you have the ability to determine what school budgets are going to be, it should probably be a good thing that there's collaboration around what those dollars are going to be. I'm going to ask our Chief Operating Officer, uh, Ursulina Ramirez, to see if she has that specific number, sir. So Chair Drum, we're going to get back to you with the specifics on how, um, how much we spent um, in this past fiscal year on professional development. But as the Chancellor alluded to, a lot of the initiatives that we are launching all include a professional development co component, including Civics for All. Um, and our recent announcement around health education. But we'll get back to you the specifics on what was spent. How do you assess your professional development? You want me to take it? Yeah. So we're going to tag team this one. Uh, again, I'm the new guy in the, in the building, so I'm still trying to assess how we assess our professional development, if that makes sense. Uh, but by and large, uh, the indicator of, a, of professional development is you have to start with those receiving the professional development. Uh, so as a teacher, I was always struck by the drive-by professional development. You have one dosage, now you're fixed, now you, you're an expert in implementation. We know that professional development is much more complex. It has to be job embedded, it has to be job related, and there has to be a continuous process for refreshing and building on those skills. I am happy to say that as I've looked at the approach we've taken in the Department of Education, we've built coaching and coaching positions, not consultants, but our own teachers in master teacher roles that are doing that kind of professional development for our own teachers. I think that is a, a universal best practice. Uh, for me, the other indicator is what is the intent of your professional development and then you align, are you seeing outcomes that are better after you've had professional development implemented? Uh, so for us, quite frankly, uh, as I look at our investment, for example, in restorative practices, um, the, the restorative uh, practices, uh, positive behavioral supports, inclusionary practices. One of the indicators that I'm going to be monitoring is how many students are now being expelled from school. So how many suspensions? Who's being suspended? How long are they being suspended? I'm going to look at disciplinary infractions in schools. And what do they look like? I'm going to be looking at the climate and culture surveys that we do in our schools in terms of how do students feel, how do parents feel, how do staff members feel in terms of the climate. Uh, one, of the, one of the sayings, and, and Chairman, you'll hear me use lots of sayings. That's just how I learn. But one of the sayings that I think is really, really important is culture eats strategy for breakfast. Uh, so if you don't address culture in a school and in a school system, it doesn't matter what strategy you use, it's never going to take hold. Uh, so what I'm very grateful to Chancellor Farina for is her real focus on changing the culture uh, of the organization. I want to continue that and accelerate that with the professional development that we're doing. So one of the things that used to drive me crazy as an educator was when a certain reading program would come in to the schools to train us, and um, they would turn the question on you to say, well, how would you deal with that situation in the classroom, rather than giving me concrete ideas. I hope that you will look at some of those programs and make sure that they're not telling teachers that same thing, uh, because that's what they're being hired to do. Uh, the same thing kind of applies, I think, also to the restorative practices. And there are different types of uh, restorative uh, justice programs within the schools. Some of them do have full-time people. Some of them are like the uh, Positive Learning Collaborative that the Uni United Federation of Teachers has been doing. So I would urge you also to look at how effective the different programs are. From my experience, the programs that have a full-time person dedicated and ensuring that everybody in the school is trained in restorative <coughs> work much better than those who, you know, when, the only, when you only train teachers. And I've used this example before. For me, when I would try to use restorative practices in my classroom, yeah, okay, I was able to get so far with the kids, but then I'd have to bring them down to, uh, to the cafeteria or out to the yard for lunchtime, and inevitably, every day, I'd have two or three kids sitting in the principal's office when I went to pick them up because others in the school building were not trained in the same practices. So we hope that you'll look at that as well. Let me go to some questions on fair student funding. Uh, will this administration commit to uh, bringing fair student funding to 100% level by the end of this mayor's term? 
so um, just a, a quick comment on what you just mm -hmm. mentioned, sir. We absolutely will keep that in mind. I couldn't be more aligned with your thinking about uh, professional development. Fair student funding, I've often described this in the community meetings that I've had. Um, as a chancellor of schools, I don't sell anything. I don't have the ability to raise the price on the product. Um, I, we don't educate, we don't build widgets, we educate souls. So as a result, we're dependent on the funding that we receive, not only from the city, but more importantly from the state of New York. And the Constitution of the state of New York has a requirement for public education. Uh, so what I am absolutely committed to is working hand in hand with our city council uh, in advocating for full funding uh, from the state to uh, the, the city of New York, but also to the Department of Education so that we can actually invest that money directly in schools and bring everybody up to 100%. Uh, now I have to say that as I looked at the percentage of investment from the city's tax levy into our public schools, uh, I was both amazed, impressed, and saddened to see the fact that the city of New York has really taken up the mantle and invested in our public schools, whereas, quite frankly, and I'm not picking a fight with anybody, but I'm willing to have that fight, the state has not lived up to its responsibility. Uh, so while I give kudos to the city council and the city and the mayor for investing in our public schools, we need to have an all-out uh, I would say action to encourage Albany to live up to their constitutional responsibility and fully fund our public schools. We know that if that happens, we will be able to not only reduce class size, we know that we'll be able to address some of the diff differentiated learning needs of our communities. We know that communities that want to have a full array of uh, different kinds of programming for our students will be able to do that. Full funding lifts all boats. So we're committed to working hand in hand, shoulder by shoulder, with all of our elected officials in the city of New York to advocate for full funding at the state level. How much more money would be needed to get to the 100% level? Yep. Hi, uh, approximately $610 million would be necessary to bring all schools to 100%. 610, yeah. And just identify yourself for the record. Ray Orlando, Chief Thank Financial you, Officer. Okay, so 610 million more. Uh, let me talk a little bit now about um, the school support services. In 2016, the New York, City, New York City created the New York City School Support Services, a nonprofit to provide custodial staff to schools. At the time of the announcement, the administration said this would be cost neutral by fiscal 19. However, significant funding was added in fiscal 2017 to 21 for the custodial restructuring. What cost saving resulted from the transition to, uh, to the um, school support services program, and um, what are the expected cost savings in fiscal 19 in the out years? Thank you, Chairman. So at this point, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use the first of my phone a friend card uh, because uh, I'm not fully briefed on this, but I'm going to ask our Chief Operating Officer, Ramirez, and, and perhaps our CFO if they can answer that for you. So we're working closely um, with our, with uh, we call it NISIS, um, to address cost savings uh, in the out years. Um, but our primary goal is to make sure that all of our schools are clean and a safe place for our students to be. And so we're working closely with OMB to make sure that there's ample funding um, so that our, our schools stay clean and that our principals are satisfied with uh, the work that's happening in the buildings. So we know that there's 45 million included in the budget for the contract for um, in fiscal 2020 to 2021. Some of the members of that union who are, are workers yep. in that, in, uh, in that um, program are here. Are you committing to making sure that we continue that funding um, right through the end of, the, um, of 2021? So we're committed to working with both the union, um, ONB, and City Hall to make sure that our schools uh, are kept intact in terms of being cl uh, clean and, and working with the unions to make sure that there are no impacts on their work. Oh, hopefully we, we're going to come to that yes. conclusion and Agreed. we're going to keep a close eye on that as well here in the council. Um, before I go to um, uh, my colleagues, by the way, let me just say we have been joined by Council Member Gibson, Council Member Brannon, Council Member Lander, Council Member Joni, Council Member Barron, Council Member Rodriguez, Council Member Rosenthal, 
Councilmember Menchaca and Councilmember Diaz. We have a very large education committee and a large finance committee, but we're glad that everybody is here and joining us today. And because we have so many people, I am going to cut it short, but of course I have to ask a question about the anti-bullying complaint portal and how that's going. So that's something that came about as a terrible tragedy that had occurred in the Bronx where an LGBT student uh, was accused of um, killing uh, another student in his class, allegedly because he was bullied. Um, none of that has been settled yet. The case is in court, and I'm not asking you to speak to that. But at that time, the mayor did commit, I think it was $10.3 million to creating this portal to um, uh, educating staff, uh, staff training, development, professional development on it, as well as funding for diversity clubs and GSAs. Can you update us on uh, the status of what's happening with that program? So I can uh, give you a high-level update around the bullying portal. It has launched. Um, and we're constantly looking at ways to make improvements on it so that we can make sure that it's uh, accessible for families. Um, and I can report back on kind of high level what we're seeing from that portal um, uh, after this. Um, I don't have the details in front of me. Um, we are making, as you mentioned. Ms. Uh, Ramirez, <laughs> did you say the portal, I'm sorry, a little hard to hear. Did you say that the portal has launched? There has been, uh, there has been a parent facing part of the portal that has launched. We're looking to make consistent updates to it to make sure that it is. Uh, uh, more accessible and tech-friendly. Can you just tell me how, if somebody were to make a complaint, mm -hmm. where does that go? So if you, can, if you call 311, that it automatically goes into, into our internal systems and we have somebody contact the family. So but you can also go online and also fill out there. Is that done through the office of Kenyatta Reed? Uh, part of Kenyatta Reed's office, correct. That, okay. Uh, safety and youth development. What I'm trying to get mm -hmm. at is who is responsible to make sure that there's a follow-up to that complaint? Um, so Kenyatta Reed's office is responsible for that. I will uh, circle back with who explicitly is responsible for getting back in touch with parents, but we do make sure that we are being responsive to families who are putting in uh, a complaint to that portal. Okay, and when do you expect to have the portal fully up and running? Um, I don't know, spring, sorry. This year, later on this year, so spring. <laughs> would really, really like to get that answered fully. Yes. Because that's a really important question. 100%. I mean, it's a life-saving question. Um, what about the GSAs? Have money gone, has money gone out to the GSAs and to the diversity clubs? One second. Yes, so we have made investments this year in our in uh, GSAs in addition to other uh, student clubs. Um, I believe we've spent approximately $50,000 on supporting individual schools for GSAs thus far. Uh, we have more investments to make. Um, 50,000? Correct. And it's supposed to go to a million, right? I have, a, I have a half a million for all of our LGBT, but I'll circle back with you on. Well, I thought it was a million dollars for support for diversity clubs. Hmm. Yes, it, it would. It's a million dollars that goes to all student clubs, including GSAs. Uh -huh. Sorry. Oh, so that was fifty thousand yes. specifically for GSAs. That was fifty thousand that just has been allocated thus far. Oh. But I'll, I'll I'll specify and circle back with you of whether that was for GSAs explicitly or if that was for all school clubs. So it is, it is a million. But um, yep. when when do you think that that money will be spent? Does that money have to be spent by June thirtieth? Uh, so there's funding in the current year uh, as well as out years for this, and uh, we'll know better uh, on how, the, how much was spent uh, as the year ends uh, next month. Okay, and I see We that can get back to you for sure. Um, that a, um, a memo went out on um, how schools can apply for this funding recently, yes. and I think the deadline is the 25th? Yes. Is that correct? I believe so. Correct. That is correct. Okay. And then what about the professional development? So the professional development is ongoing, and you know, I, I do want to thank you for your initial investments that you've made um, in this work. Um, and as you know, both uh, Kimberly Shannon and uh, Jared Fox have been kind of doing a road show and making sure that we're providing professional development to a lot of schools. Um, but things are ongoing, and, they're, and a lot, there's a lot of requests um, for PD in this area. Um, and we're making sure that we're providing Jared ample support to, to do that. 
So I'm glad that you acknowledge that there are a lot of requests, and yes. I think that Jared has been doing a fantastic job. Um, maybe we need another Jared, and I think would really urge you to consider that because, from what I understand, is that he's pretty much overwhelmed with requests. Yeah. He is overwhelmed with requests, and he is trying to figure out how to prioritize to, to the chancellor's point around equity. You know, what is the most need? Um, I think Jared is not replicable, but uh, trying to find somebody who can support him, I think, is, a, is the right idea. No, I agree. I just think that, um, you know, now that um, this issue is being discussed fully mm -hmm. and it's a priority for the chancellor, that we should probably look at that because I think that um, teachers want this information and they need it desperately because they're dealing with this, with this issue more and more in the classrooms. Agreed. So we'll look into that and get back to you. Okay, thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Chair Traeger now. Thank you. Uh, Chair Drum, and I just want to, before I go into my questions, I just want to also thank the Chancellor for um, acknowledging the 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 state of some of many of our schools for acknowledging that our that there are quite a number of schools that have historically been underfunded, underserved, um, systematically, methodically, disproportionately affecting certain communities more than others, and. I share that exact same sentiment, and I really appreciate that. No child, no staff member of a school, no teacher, no parent makes a conscious decision to underperform. And it's the government that has failed uh, too many communities. So I, I do want to begin by thanking you for, for, for that acknowledgement. Um, Mr. Chancellor, I, I shared some data before in my opening remarks. I just want to uh, re repeat some of it. Um, According to DOE figures, there are uh, 1,293 social workers. There's 2,880 guidance counselors, 583 uh, school psychologists, and over 5,500 school safety officers. And just to note, uh, guidance counselors at the elementary school level are not mandated. In a school system of over 1.1 million children, do you believe that we are effectively meeting the social and emotional needs of our students? So Chairman Traeger, I think that we always can make more investments in that regard. Uh, unfortunately, um, some of the legacy federal programs and uh, rhetoric that has happened around public education has focused on accountability in terms of academics, and that's important. Uh, but uh, there is a growing body of research as well as a movement to recognize that not only is it important for students to be able to read and to write and do arithmetic and science, but it's also important for students to be well adjusted and well supported in an educational environment to be able to uh, engage in the academic, academic learning process. So as all of us uh, across the nation are now realizing and revamping our systems to acknowledge that in terms of not only curriculum, but also professional development, and staffing, uh, we are in the process of uh, aligning ourselves to that. So I, w I, I uh, am very much professionally uh, in support of increasing how we provide that support in terms of essential positions around guidance counseling uh, in many of our schools, social workers that are necessary, uh, community school coordinators uh, as well. So that is a growing body of work that I'm very, very interested in supporting in our system. Right, as I shared with you, Mr. Chancellor, and at the at the Fair Student Funding press conference, the, the chair and I witnessed the impact of a social worker in a school building, uh, creating a, a feeling of sa of welcomeness and a sanctuary and safety, and how that had a cascading effect on attendance and uh, academic outcomes. So I I really believe that this is an area that we have to do better on. Um, according to, to uh, uh, an answer we received from the DOE, uh, we, we received this reply to a question about, uh, the question was, how many schools do not have a dedicated guidance counselor and or social worker, and what is the cost of providing this in all schools? And this is the answer we received. 
41 schools have no guidance counselor or social worker. The cost to provide at least one full-time guidance counselor or social worker to these schools would be approximately $5.2 million. So $5.2 million in a budget of over $25 billion. Mr. Chancellor, can you commit to making sure that every single school has at least one guidance counselor and social worker? Well, again, not knowing what those schools are, what the composition of those schools are, and again, being very clear that I think it's important that we have guidance counseling and that we have social workers. Um, I also think it's important, and, and our system has memorialized the notion that uh, there is local control. Student, pr principals get to make decisions along with their staffs around what they want to prioritize in their funding. Uh, again, I'll go back to the plea that I've made and that this council has been very supportive of a, uh, fully funding the fair student funding formula. That, that would give everyone a level of funding that would ensure that there's resources to fund these types of essential positions. What I will commit to is that we will look at what those schools are and where they're, where they're investing their resources and absolutely work towards making sure that all student uh, needs are being met in those schools. Right, and as we, as I also mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, there was only, I believe, a minimal increase to the amount of social supports for students in temporary housing. Over 100,000 students in temporary housing, there is an insufficient amount of social support, social workers, dedicated licensed personnel, and the reason why I specify these titles, these are folks who are licensed and credentialed to do this work. We can't cut corners on these issues. Mm -hmm. You need folks who know what they're doing, who are trained and licensed in this particular field, and this is a, a critical needed investment because you know, we, we have read reports, we, we have spoken with families where uh, students are, uh, you know, there's chronic absenteeism, there's almost no follow-up work happening. This is an area that we have fallen short on and we, we have to address. I, I wanna get to fair student funding. Uh, I know my uh, uh, colleague touched upon this, but let's, let's go back to this issue. Um, so there are currently 93 schools receiving over 100% of their fair student funding. These schools range from receiving 101% to 161% this school year. At the same time, there are 703 schools receiving less than 90%. Please explain this variance in funding amount and if there are plans to correct this and equitably distribute FSF among all schools. Uh, Chairman Traeger, I'm gonna ask our CFO to uh, answer that question for you, please. Good morning. Um, uh, yes, there are schools that are over 100% uh, of the fair student funding formula. Uh, I would remind everyone that the fair student funding formula makes up about 60% of the average school's budget, um, with 40% coming from the 100-odd uh, other uh, school allocation memos. Uh, as to the schools that are over 100%, uh, the, at the birth of the formula back in school year 2007-2008, um, no school was uh, determined was going to be allowed to receive less money than it had received in the prior school year. Um, so uh, at that time, uh, schools had uh, different levels of support based on each community school district and superintendent's determination. And so when you ran the formula against those allocations, some schools were in fact above. Uh, those, at that time, the decision was made that no school could lose, uh, would receive less money year over year. And so it's a legacy of the implementation of the formula dating back over 10 years that some schools are over 100%. Um, for what it's worth, uh, the fact remains that we have been working very carefully over the last four years to go like this, if you pardon the, the image to bring the schools at the bottom up, and to bring the schools over 100 down. Uh, we've made significant uh, changes to our policies to, uh, to uh, allow for schools to float uh, downwards over time uh, in an attempt to make the system more equitable. Uh, 
for what it's worth, uh, most of the schools over 100% are uh, between 100 and 110. Uh, not that that's much comfort, uh, obviously, to schools below uh, 100%, um, but it is uh, both a, a small number of schools uh, and a, uh, a, a legacy of the implementation of the system. Right, and I just want to, you know, give for an example, uh, Abraham Lincoln High School in Coney Island in my district, because uh, they were at 87 percent and the new floor will be 90 percent, we'll see a couple hundred thousand dollar increase to their school budget. Um, and that's the difference between, you know, art, music programs, social workers, other types of supports. And we just have so much more to go in terms of raising the floor. Now, look, I, I agree with you. We, we, we went to Albany and we spoke to the governor directly, spoke to other folks directly about fulfilling CFE obligations. And we made it also very clear that there is transparency in our school budgets. Uh, there, was, there was a lot of misinformation about there, uh, about that issue, and we brought copies of school allocation memos uh, with us. Um, uh, having said that, we have to make sure that when we do see increases in school aid, that they actually reach the school communities. And, and that's something that uh, is very important to us. Do you believe that uh, FSF is the right measure in determining how much funding a school requires uh, for their instructional needs? Are there other measures that DOE should be looking at to assess whether schools are adequately funded? Uh, we strongly support the formula. Um, we review the formula annually um, based on the data available to us uh, that feeds uh, the various components of the formula. Uh, but we uh, believe that the formula uh, does allocate. Uh, we don't believe there's a problem with the formula. We believe there's a problem with the funding, right? Um, and if we were able to bring all schools to 100% with the state aid that's been denied to us, um, we think the formula works for us. Um, could the formula have, uh, you've made some suggestions about what other, other permutations that could be added to the formula and stuff like that. We'd be happy to talk about uh, those kinds of things with you uh, and other interested parties um, for sure. Uh, but uh, we, we, we believe in the formula. Right, I, I just want to just reiterate that in examining the formula, um, I believe that poverty is accounted for up to the third grade, but the amount of funding that we have pegged for poverty, I think is grossly insufficient. Uh, it is under $500 per student. I, I believe that, first of all, I think we need to understand that poverty exists beyond the third grade as well. Uh, and I do not believe that test scores are an effective proxy beyond the third grade to deal with issues of poverty. Um, and we do need to increase that amount. Uh, do we agree on that? Uh, I could agree with you that the formula could <laughs> encompass other types of weights. And we'd be happy to discuss what those weights might look like and how much they might cost uh, whenever you like. Um, the executive budget baselines $20 million in OTPS savings at DOE from unspent funds in school budgets. At the same time, it makes a $125 million investment in school budgets. Was this $20 million in savings used to pay for the additional investment in per student funding? If not, why not? And what will these savings be used towards? Uh, as part of our ongoing work with uh, the Office of Management and Budget uh, and City Hall and you all. Uh, we're constantly looking at our budget uh, to identify uh, policies and programs um, uh, to meet the needs of students. Uh, this particular re reduction uh, is related to uh, the fact that uh, n it's very difficult to manage your budget to zero, as I think we all know. Um, and so from time to time, schools run surpluses in any given year. Um, and we have business rules around uh, which schools are able to use those funds in the subsequent year. This doesn't affect the current year. It affects the, the, the schools in the current year will be able to continue to roll over their surpluses as they have. Um, and in the next year, um, we're going to look at the business rules around that. And uh, if we can find a better way to save that $20 million, we will. Uh, I, I, I will. Uh 
take you up on your offer, Mr. Chancellor, to we'll go up to Albany together, we'll advocate as much as we can to make the case. We just need to be clear when we go to Albany and others where this funding actually goes towards. But this is an area that we do agree, that Albany needs to fund New York City schools, both the historic cost and, and the current cost. Um, I want to uh, discuss paid parental leave. Um, how much would it cost to provide paid parental leave to all DOE staff? I mean, I'll, I'll start this, but I mean, it's, it's complicated to, uh, in terms of, uh, the, these are ongoing labor negotiations and it's kind of complicated to develop those costs, uh, but I'll have Ray kind of speak to that. Sure, just briefly, uh, Councilman. Um, it depends a lot on how many people uh, become pregnant, how many women become pregnant, uh, or how many folks choose to adopt uh, or foster children. Uh, it becomes very difficult to determine when, in fact, that occurs. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, it's, very, it, it's very complicated and it's very hard to, to calculate how much it might cost. Um, and uh, as uh, Ursulina mentioned, um, we're, we've been speaking with uh, folks about that on the labor relations side. Uh, as part of the collective bargaining discussions that have been ongoing. All right. I, I just want to make very clear that, I, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, Mr. Chancellor, right now our current system forces educators to declare a sickness in order to raise a family. And I don't believe raising a family is a sickness. I think my colleagues agree with that statement, and I hope that the DOE agrees with that statement, and I believe that we have to do everything possible to rectify this immediately, and, and I understand that there are negotiations and discussions, but the, 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 the public impact of not having this policy in place is, first of all, according to DOE's own figures, we are losing quality educators, particularly after three, four, five years of service. That data is clear. There are public health benefits. There are so many other social benefits in making sure this policy is in place. I just want to emphasize to this administration, to, to the chancellor and, and to folks, this is, critically, this is critically important to this council, critically important to New York City and, and our families that we get this done. Chairman Traeger, if, if, if I may. So obviously we're not going to negotiate in public. Right. Um, that notwithstanding, let me be very clear, as a, as a chancellor of the New York City public school system, our biggest, greatest, most valuable asset in our system, aside from the students we serve, are those that are teaching our students, those that are in the classroom, those that are working with our students directly. Uh, so we will be, and I will be very supportive of anything that helps those individuals not only stay with our system, uh, but provide the best service to our students and our communities, uh, and also treat them with the respect that they deserve. Uh, so again, uh, I think it's pretty clear our commitment is exactly aligned with what you've stated here today. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chancellor. We have some things in common. We're going to, go up to Albany to fight for our schools. We both like the color blue. Uh, <laughs> and we, we value our, our educators. I have uh, one last uh, question area and then I'll turn to my colleagues who have been very patient. Accessibility. Um, true integration of schools will require the integration of students with mobility impairments. DOE's current quantitative accessibility goals focus on district percentages for elementary grades. Under the current capital plan, DOE's goal is to reach a maximum, a minimum, sorry, minimum of 30% building accessibility for elementary grades in every district. DOE's goal for the next five-year capital plan is to reach 40% for elementary grades across all districts contingent upon available funding. How many additional projects or how much additional funding would be required to meet 50% building accessibility for elementary grades in every district in the next five-year capital plan? Thank you, Chairman. Um, at this point, it would be impossible for me to say we would have to do a survey and we'd have to figure that out. We can get back to you on that. Um, this is uh, an issue that's very personal to me as a, t as a former teacher and personal very much to our colleagues. 
Um, we have heard from parents, from families, from advocates. Uh, this is a real, real problem in our school system. This is a part of the segregation conversation as well, that there are too many schools not accessible to our kids and to our families, and the message is, the message it's sending is that this school is not for you, and that is just not acceptable. Um, now, I also just want to just make sure that we're clear. Um, before the prelim budget hearing, you confirmed that you are on track to have 60 accessible emergency shelter sites by the fall of 2018. Is this still the case? That's still the case. There has been no change? No, none. And no request of a court extension because last year the city administration asked the court to extend? We're on track, sir. We're on track. Um, Okay, I, I will, uh, I have some additional questions, but in the interest of time, I will now uh, turn back to Chair Drum. Just before we leave that question, though, uh, President Grillo, uh, I had the BOE here, the Board of Elections, uh, last week, and um, they spend a large amount of money on ramps for the elections. And I'm wondering, are you coordinating with them, and is there any possibility that we could look at a permanent <coughs> ramp um, uh, construction uh, to alleviate the, the cost that we have to spend, not only just for putting those ramps in every election time, but also for the storage. Um, so do you coordinate with the BOE? We, we do coordinate with the uh, Board of Elections. Um, and Okay, so. I, yes. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. <laughs> this is uh, Tom Taracco. He is uh, in charge of space management um, and really is managing for the DOE, the accessibility program. So it's best to answer that question. So we, so that's, that is part of the, that is a conversation that's ongoing in terms of uh, making the schools more accessible? Absolutely, absolutely. And we coordinate with uh, Board of Elections constantly. Will we see in the future some reduction in terms of the number of ramps that the BOE needs to install? As we continue to make these buildings accessible, I'm sure that's, that'll be the case. Okay, all right, thank you. Oh, one last question, if I can, with Chair Prerogative here. In your testimony, um, President Grillo, you mentioned that there were 8,000 new seats, additional seats. Where would those seats be? Throughout the, throughout the city, in those uh, overcrowded districts, and you will see that in the capital plan. Okay, and um, it's, it's about eight schools maybe, right? Um, Eight to ten schools, Eight depending ten upon schools. the grade levels. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, we have been joined by Councilmember Borelli, Councilmember Levin, Councilmember Kalos, Councilmember Salamanca, and now we're going to go to questions from council members. We'll start with Councilmember Grudenchik, followed by Adams, Holden, and Rose. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Good morning, uh, Chancellor. Good morning, Lorraine. I was worried that we were going to ignore you totally. I was just sitting there and figuring you might not. So I want to say before I get into the chance, I want to thank you, uh, Ms. Grillo, for, uh, for your collaboration in Eastern Queens, and I look forward to building those and more. I have more sites, so <laughs> I promise you. Uh, Mr. Chance, I think it's the fourth time I've seen you, which is uh, pretty good for a guy from Eastern Queens. I don't, we, 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 it's where the, uh, where the prairie meets the city. Um, I do want to talk about what Chair Traeger talked about, and that is fair student funding. And um, Mr. Orlando said that it only makes up 60%. So that's disappointing, but uh, it's also encouraging at the same time uh, because it means more money is going into the classrooms. I know you've only been here eight weeks and you've had a whirlwind, but I can't stress strongly enough how important it is to get more money into the hands of the educators, taking it out of the hands of the bureaucrats because uh, principal after principal that I speak to and I meet with all of them during the school year, um, some of them many times, um, relate to me how, as Chair Traeger said, how they could do more, with whatever they want to do. I'm not, I'm not picking on whether it's guidance counselors or more powers or more teachers, but it's so important that we get more money into the hands of the principals and the, the leadership teams in the schools. Um, you know, some of my schools, I was trying to figure out, I have three of my schools here, they're fair student funding formulas. I counted 33 separate lines and I was being generous, it may be more. So um, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at this uh, formula yet, but um, take a few Excedrin before you do because uh, it's a cause of an instant headache. Um, I, I would just ask in my question, I guess, I would like to 
Mr. Orlando, if you could give me a card, because I'd like to call you and we can talk about how uh, funds get into schools. Um, I'd like to talk to you, uh, Mr. Chancellor, just to ask you, um, how do, you, how do you have a plan yet for getting more money out of the bureaucracy and more money into the classrooms? Because that's re really where the rubber meets the road. So I appreciate it, sir, and, and I, I promise I'm not stalking you, but it has been good That's to all see right. you. That's all right. I've been stalked by worse, so, you know, <laughs> those chances, not so bad. But I have enjoyed our, our visits together, so thank you so much. Uh, I, again, you, the, the, the lens that we're applying is the lens of equity. So in a system, in any system, you have to assess the needs of the system. And if we truly believe that all students in the system should be served well, then recognizing that not all students cross our threshold equally prepared or uh, with even the same amount of challenges or privileges, uh, then you have to, from an equity perspective, provide the supports that are necessary in schools. Now, there are funding mechanisms for providing for those kinds of students. We've talked about how are we providing supports for students in uh, temporary housing. By definition, the supports that we, the millions of dollars that we invest in making sure that we are providing supports to those students in temporary housing could be considered bureaucracy because they're not people that are necessarily in the classroom teaching students, but they're critically important in meeting a need that exists within the organization. So part of the work that we're doing is to identify what are those essential supports how are they tied to the priorities that not only the mayor has identified, but this city council has identified, uh, and are quite frankly our stakeholders have identified, and then be as transparent and clear as possible about where that's going. I'll give you an example. We have social workers in our school system that work in schools, but we also have single shepherd program where we have social workers that don't work necessarily tied to a school, but tied to a caseload. I heard a story of a uh, single shepherd social worker that uh, followed a student uh, to court because they had an incident they had to go to court to, uh, waited in court with that student for almost seven hours until that case or that was looked at by the judge. And the judge was impressed that that student had an advocate there with them the whole time. And whereas that judge may not have granted that student the ability to leave because they had an adult that cared said, you're free to go. Those are the types of investments that we're making where that social worker, had they been placed specifically at a school, may not have had the latitude to leave the school and go with that student. So we're trying to be as thoughtful as we can about how we're supporting schools and how we're supporting uh, the goals that we have and quite frankly, our moral values uh, in our school systems. That being said, uh, we are looking at efficiencies. We are looking, I, I'll, I'll, and I'll be very clear about this, as I've looked at how we, for example, a central part of what we do in our school system is how do we teach reading in our school system. I've stopped counting the number of reading programs we have in our school system. Why? because we have this sense that we should have local control and local decision making, and that's fine and that's good. Except when you're talking about efficiencies, when you're talking about economies of scale, there needs to be a little bit more tighter alignment between what are we doing instructionally, how are we then leveraging resources to provide not only professional de uh, development support, supervision, instructional materials, et cetera, and a laissez-faire system that allows anybody to decide anything because you have local control. That's the balance that we're gonna be working and that's the balance that I'm gonna be engaging in conversations, not only with our principals, but our teachers, uh, around how much is too much? How can we go from 32 different, and I'm just using that as an example, 32 different reading programs to let's say five. Five that we know are effective, five that we know are, are showing results for our our communities in the school system, and then we can much more effectively support five rather than 30 or 40 or 50. Those are the types of efficiencies that I'm just rolling up my sleeves and getting into as we go forward. Um, but whatever we do, we want to identify how we're gonna be able to invest more resources in our schools and actually give principals, and I wanna be really clear about this, I'm a former principal, uh, but I've 
I often become very, very nervous when I hear, uh, and this is not to you, council member, but anyone in the community that says, well, the principal can decide how they're gonna use their resources. Mm -hmm. No, they can't. A principal should be working with their community. So they should be working with their teachers, they should be working with their support staff, they should be working with their parents, and the community should be deciding how they're investing their resources in that particular community. So there's a number of things that we're trying to do uh, to make sure that that's effective and efficient. But again, I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna be a broken record on this. We need to ensure that Albany is going to fully fund because then that gives us resources to actually move right directly into our school communities as well. So just to follow up, if we got more money from Albany, we could send it right to the classrooms because we wouldn't need any additional bureaucracy. <laughs> well, it depends what you mean by bureaucracy. I mean, well, listen, I, I have bureaucracy in my house. I have to pay for the, the you know, I got to pay Con Ed, I got to pay National Grid, but I don't want to give them one penny more than they deserve. So that's where I'm at. And, and I agree. And I, I appreciate you and I appreciate uh, your willingness to take on this very, very difficult task. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Councilmember Adams. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Chairs Drum and Traeger. Um, good morning to all of you. It's so nice to see you. So nice to see you, President Grillo, as well. Um, Chancellor, welcome. Thank you. Uh, I represent the 28th District, Jamaica, Richmond Hill, South Ozone Park in Queens, and um, I've been hearing of your visits, and I thank you very much for them. Um, I have been a very vocal um, proponent of co-location for a number of years. And I don't think it's any secret to a lot of folks out there. I just wanted to mention something and then I'm gonna go into a, another line of questioning. Um, August Martin High School in Jamaica in September will <clears throat> include a sixth school, um, which will be a District 75 school <clears throat> within one building. Um, I've said repeatedly that I believe that the blue book has been used as a weapon against communities of color um, for a number of years now. And to me, this is yet another glaring representation of how the blue book is being used um, as an instance of uh, quote unquote underutilization in a school. I just think that we can do far better for our students all across the board, especially District 75 students. I happen to have a nephew who, who is in that community um, and is doing quite well. I just think that we in New York City need to do a much better job of that. Um, moving on to another line of conversation, which is one that we don't have too often, and I think that it's something that we need to seriously start speaking about, and that is the issue of human trafficking in New York City amongst our students. Um, I just need to know whether or not the DOE has a formal protocol regarding human trafficking among students. Uh, Council Member Adams, um, I don't know if we do or not, but we are gonna get back to you with that answer. A formal okay. protocol for human trafficking of students. Okay, I would, I would, th my thought was that um, the um, DOE Child Abuse and Neglect Prevention and Intervention Unit would provide specific training to our educators regarding this serious issue, but I really would appreciate follow-up to that. We are, we are making very much needed allowances for our students in shelter. We are providing funding for our students in shelter, yet we are not really conversing around the issue, very serious issue, because I know that it's going on in my own district, which is why I bring it up. And you and I can have another conversation about that um, very serious issue. Um, I really need to know whether or not the principals and educators are being trained to handle students who have been trafficked and who are sitting in our classrooms. Some age 16 and 17 are sitting with students who are 13 and 14 years old and are not equipped uh, to handle uh, the classes that they are taking spaces in. So I do wanna leave that at your front door and I do welcome your follow up on that issue. Thank you so very much. Councilmember Adams, I really appreciate you mentioning that. We're gonna follow up specifically around that issue. I will. Uh, state that I am very sensitive to the issue of human trafficking, uh, having worked with the Commission on the Status of Women in San Francisco and then most recently in Houston, which uh, is uh, a hotbed 
um, for human trafficking, uh, this is an issue that is very dear to my heart uh, because uh, our vulnerable students become prey. Uh, and so I am very sensitive to this issue and thank you for bringing it up. We will get back to you, but more importantly, I wanna know for my edification, what are our protocols and how are we training folks? So thank you for bringing that. Thank you very much, Mr. Chancellor. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, Council Member Holden and then Rose. Uh, we've been joined also by Council Members Cohen and Ulrich. Uh, thank you, Chancellor and uh, President Grillo. Um, I just wanna mention, I represent District 24 which is the most overcrowded. We need something like 5,000 new seats, which are unfunded as of now, and we have a crisis situation, certainly in the district, and uh, looking forward to working with Lorraine Grillo on this, um, but we, we're, in a, we're in dire straits. And then we have uh, upzoning of Queens Boulevard going on with I mean, thousands of more apartments coming in, so we need, uh, we need a task force in our area. But I, I want to talk about um, something that's near and dear to me. I visited a school, uh, District 75. I want to piggyback on, on District 75 students who are the most neediest, obviously. And we have a situation, and I visited uh, the headquarters in Queens, uh, uh, District 75, at least my part of Queens, PS9, which is a building built in 1905 for all boys. It's now obviously um, boys and girls in there. Um, one bathroom per floor, which is, and the boys have to wait for the girls to get out and the girls have out, vice versa. We have changing um, tables in front of urinals in there. We have a most disgraceful situation. I wanna, I wanna praise Chair Traeger for coming out and spending a couple hours visiting last week and he saw for himself and I also want to thank Chair Drum for supporting the school, putting money toward uh, the auditorium. But this is a situation where we need immediate attention. There's, the bathroom facilities are inadequate, obviously. There's no real gymnasium. There's no real cafeteria. Um, and many of these children with autism, Down syndrome, and many of the students are from homeless shelters, special needs students, obviously, and foster children. They have, some, they have the challenges when they go home. When they go to school, they should have a bright, nice building. This is more than just an old building. This is totally ridiculous. It's actually something from medieval times almost. And, and, it's, and to make matters worse, Chancellor, this is in a heavily industrial area. They're hiding these kids, and it's sickening. Previous administrations have neglected the, this population and this is the poster child. This PS9 is the poster child of neglect. So I'd, I'd like your attention on this. I'd like to bring you out there. Um, I'd like you to see for yourself what we're doing. And this has to be put aside. This should be the last semester that these students have to tolerate this situation. So council member, thank you for uh, mentioning this particular issue. Uh, it is unacceptable that any student regardless of their needs, any student would be in an environment that is substandard. So this is a particular concern to me. Uh, staff brought this to my attention and I invite in the future, please feel free to bring it to my attention directly as well. Uh, but staff brought this to my attention. Uh, we immediately uh, have asked people to come out. I know that President Grillo herself has gone out to visit, so I'd like to ask her if she can update you on where we are and what the status is. Sure. Um, thank you, Council Member. Uh, you and I have spoken about this. I've also spoken with Chair Traeger about this. We recognize the, the challenges of this building. Right now, we're in the process of uh, evaluating next steps and um, evaluating the building overall. Um, in the meantime, as a result of some of the conversations we've had, um, we have halted the elevator project right now, and we're going to reevaluate that. The other thing is, um, at the request of the, the chairman, we've uh, taken some air quality testing. We've done that in the building. And just so everyone knows, I received the results this morning. The building is safe for occupancy. I can share that with you. But we take this very, very seriously. I've been meeting with the chancellor's staff as well as um, internally at the SCA to see what, what next steps can, can be. 
And, and I'm really supporting um, Councilmember Holden in this effort. I mean, I, I have given money. Sandy Kroshek, who's uh, one of the instructional people there, is fantastic, and she's really fighting for that school. Um, I have not had the opportunity to visit it, but from what, what uh, Councilmember Holden has described, it really, really needs our attention quickly. So, um, let me let me also take another uh, chair prerogative question here for um, uh, President Grillo. In your testimony, you stated that um, you were able to increase the number of Queens High School seats by 2,000 since the publication of the February amendment. Are these 2,000 seats in addition to the 3,595 seats uh, funded in the um, February amendment? No, no. What we were talking about, we were able to increase the number cited seats. Okay. Know. So. Um, all right, that's what we wanted to know. That's what we wanted to know if those were cited. And the same thing for the other 8,000, right? Those was, you were able to cite those. Correct. Right, okay, good. All right, so we're going to go now to Councilmember Rose, followed by Powers, and then Gibson and Lander. Thank you, Chair. And it's good to see you again. Um, I'm always impressed when people find their way to Staten Island, um, the other borough, and uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's one of five. But uh, anyway, um, I, I, I want to thank you, you know, for, um, for your visit. And at the time, I did tell you that I really needed to have a, a meeting with you because I have a whole plethora of, of issues that I'd like to speak to you. And that has not changed. Um, and so in keeping with the forum here, I only have five minutes, but I have a panoply of questions for you. So I'm going to just, like, throw um, as many out as I can um, with the hope of getting um, a, a response. So um, there's $3 million that was set aside for expanding restorative justice programs within our schools. Um, could you, you know, tell me what that expansion, you know, looks like or entails? And um, on Staten Island, we had a persistently um, uh, dangerous school. Um, it, it was deemed persistently dangerous. And um, one of the options that they gave us was to become a community school, but through the 21st Century Grant, um, which is funded at a fraction of what a DOE-funded um, community school is funded at. And I was just wondering if there's any plans to um, increase the funding for um, community schools. Um, for President Grillo, uh, you said in your statement that um, that you had moved into the feasibility of three additional sites, um, one of which was District 31. I was hope that you could elaborate on that. And and one of the and my last question is one of the issues uh, that my parents talk about all the time is with the increase of gun violence um, in the schools. Um, what measures are being taken to um, structurally, uh, like cameras, uh, sound systems within the school that, that are functioning and, and audible? Um, and is there anything in the making to make sure that all of our schools are prepared? Um, and uh, if so, is there funding to do this in um, an expeditious uh, manner. Thank you. <laughs> so Deputy uh, Leader Rose, well done. You got them all in. Uh, so uh, I want to publicly uh, restate that we will schedule a, a time where you and I can sit and actually work through a number of, of the issues in detail. Uh, for some of the things that you've asked, we're going to have to get back to you. I can tell you that in, ter in terms of restorative justice, we're increasing our footprint into districts 12, 5, and 16 in terms of the professional development. Uh, I have recently met with our deputy chancellor who's going to be rolling that out. We want to make sure that the anti-bias training and the restorative uh, practices include uh, substantial um, tools, whether it's protocols, whether it's uh, curricula, but tools that teachers can use to establish uh, positive, positive environments in their classrooms. Uh, so we wanted to be useful, but then we also wanted to be replicative across the system as well. Chancellor, uh, would you consider social workers a part of 
those tools that would be um, useful in restorative justice? I wouldn't consider the social workers to be part of restorative practices. I would consider them to be uh, additional supports. That's that, um, uh, let's see how I wanna put this. They, they help solidify practices in school environments. Uh, but they are not, in other words, let me, be, let me try to be clearer. A school that receives training on restorative practices doesn't absolutely need a social worker to make sure it's gonna be effective. But we know that when you add essential personnel like social workers, that it helps to solidify that practice. So it's a best practice that we're gonna be working towards. Uh, I know you asked a question specifically of President Grillo around safety. Yes. Uh, and I think it's important that, um, if you don't mind, if I just state a couple of, of sure. philosophical uh, positions and then I'll turn it over to President Grillo. Uh, I, can, I can tell you, um, Deputy Leader Rose, as a, a teacher, as a principal, having worked in the classroom, uh, we will never, ever be able to harden our school sites against a motivated attacker. It's just not gonna happen. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that because we could invest in additional fencing. We could, ad uh, we could invest in additional, um, we could, uh, uh, metal detectors. We could do random searches. We could have, it's starting to sound a lot like a prison. Well, and we know that even in prisons with that. all of those measures that things happen in those schools, in those environments. So we can never sufficiently harden any any structure against an attacker. And I just wanna be very clear about that because that's also been a theme that parents have talked to me about. Uh, because if you hardened it, how do you hard, harden recess? How, how do you harden drop off? How do you harden pickup? How do you harden, there's just a, schools are schools. But what we have found, and the research is clear, is that when you are able to create and nurture and provide resources so that you create environments that p students feel a sense of responsibility for their safety as well as their peers. And they feel that they have an environment where they see something, they hear something, they suspect something, they, can, they, they have somebody in that school that they can tell and they know they're gonna be held anonymous and they know that the adult is going to actually follow up on it. Those are the most effective security systems mm -hmm. in our schools because while the adults, we may think we know what's happening in the school, the, the ones that truly know what's happening in the pulse are students. Uh, so it's been documented that that's effective and that's why our investments around restorative practices, positive behavioral supports, the addition of counselors, the addition of social workers, the addition of culturally relevant pedagogy, while it's educationally sound, it also is going towards creating that safe and secure environment. I will just share one little factoid that is uh, painful to me, having most recently, uh, prior to coming to New York City, served in Houston, Santa Fe, Texas, was about 30 miles south from Houston. I know the superintendent, I know who the principal is in Santa Fe. And this weekend, having a conversation uh, with my colleagues that are still in Texas, with that tragedy, this school had everything that people talk about. They had security cameras, they had armed police officers at the doors, uh, and they had practiced just the week before an armed intruder drill. And yet we saw what happened. And the tragedy that is even more profound is that the perpetrator of violence and the, the school police officers, and I don't know if this has been widely uh, advertised, but engaged in a 20 plus minute firefight. God. So as they're conducting the autopsies on the victims, they're trying to determine whether they were really killed by the perpetrator or friendly fire in that firefight. So this notion that if you just put police officers or if you just add cameras or if you just harden buildings is going to protect you, it is not the answer. It is part of the answer. Mm -hmm. But the biggest safety initiative we can do is exactly what this city has already in invested in building those safe, supportive environments where students feel safe and supported, and when they see something, they hear something, they suspect something, they report it, and it gets acted upon. Uh, with, with that soliloquy, I'm going to turn it over <laughs> to our president, <laughs> President Grillo. 
Thank you. It's very hard to follow the <laughs> chancellor, I can tell you that. Um, we do have an ongoing program uh, for uh, cameras, internet protocol. We call them IPDVS, video surveillance cameras. Uh, and we've been working through that over this capital plan. Uh, we've successfully implemented that in 714 buildings, and it's an ongoing program. You did mention earlier um, the um, class size reduction funding for a site in District 31. Um, I would ask that we do not publicly state that site until the feasibility um, study is completed. Mm -hmm because if in fact it's not feasible, I don't want uh, the school or the community to be disappointed. So we will let you know as soon as that feasibility study is complete. Okay, thank okay. you. You know, and um, when I talked about some of the, the things that we need, um, the PA system in most of our schools is not, you know, adequate. And I, I really, it, it, it transcends the safety issue. Mm -hmm. it, um, so I was just wondering, is there some sort of internal plan to sort of upgrade the PA systems and, you know, in well, all of the schools? As I've mentioned, um, every year the SCA sends a group of architects and engineers to every building and we rate every major system. So if a PA system is uh, not functioning, uh, certainly that will be rated at number five, which is the the worst mm -hmm. condition. And those are the, the projects that we undertake in the capital plan, the fives. Okay. So that's an ongoing practice for us. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank okay, you. thank you. Uh, Council Member uh, Gibson. We've also been joined by Council Members King, Cornegie, and Moya. Thank you so much, Chair Drum and Chair Traeger. Good afternoon, Chancellor. Good afternoon, President Grillo. It's great to see you here to you and your team. Um, I'm grateful that after eight weeks, you're still smiling and you're still optimistic about moving this city forward as it relates to our public school scholars, so I'm grateful. Um, and I'm also grateful that you've given attention to the Bronx, uh, where we throw our X's up, the Bronx, um, which I appreciate. The Bronx is considered, you know, certainly we have a lot of schools that are in need and facing certain challenges, but I do appreciate a lot of the work um, that has been done. So I have a few questions that I'm usually just going to spit out, but I do want to recognize uh, Chair Traeger talked a little bit about recognizing the investments that we should continue to make with social workers and guidance counselors. When you compare that to school safety agents, we're certainly not providing an equitable distribution, and certainly we want the message to be that we care about social workers and psychiatrists and guidance counselors just as we do about public safety. Um, I'm grateful that this executive budget is going to add an additional 10 social workers for students in temporary housing, um, which I represent school district nine in the Bronx, which has a high concentration. So that's very important to me. And that brings us up to 62 schools. So I wanted to understand further what the ongoing conversations are with DOE and DHS, because it seems like the numbers are going in the wrong direction, where we have more students in temporary housing entering our schools. Um, certainly restorative justice has been very important to me and many others, and we've talked about addressing the school to prison pipeline and looking at restorative practices, which we have in many of our schools, so certainly I want that to continue. Um, I wanted to ask two questions about school food. This city council has been very supportive of universal free lunch, as well as breakfast in classroom. We have a city issue of dealing with hunger, so certainly we want students to be in school with a well-nutritious meal, the quality of the food, as well as getting breakfast and lunch. So I wanted to find out an update on that and our efforts to provide uh, universal access. And then school closures and renewal and rise schools. Uh, Ursula is very familiar with me and some of the schools that I have had closed under the renewal program, but we still have remaining schools that are now rise schools. So I wanted to understand what the budget looks like and how we continue to focus on many of those schools because although they may be out of the area of closure, they're not that high in terms of excelling that we wanna lose sight of them. 
And so I, I do want to make reference that I have a lot. I probably have about six remaining middle schools that are renewal schools, and my superintendent's amazing, but we do need support. So I wanted to understand that, and certainly students in temporary housing, I've always said that your housing status should not determine your academic future. And although we've done great with dealing with truancy and absenteeism, adding bus routes and more literacy coaches, we need to do more. Um, and so I wanted to just throw those questions out just so that you can understand um, our perspective from District 9 in the Bronx. Thank you. Council Member Gibson, thank you so much for those questions. I've really enjoyed uh, the time that we spend in the schools in the Bronx. Uh, I have to tell you, I've had a great time in all of our boroughs, uh, but the Bronx uh, has really taken it on um, in many ways. And I think you've articulated uh, some of the opportunities, I'm not going to say challenges, but opportunities that we have to do right by our students, uh, particularly in the Bronx. So a couple of, a couple of thoughts, and then I'm going to ask my colleagues to jump in sure. on some of those questions as well. Uh, we are very, very uh, supportive of increasing the, the support systems for our students, especially from an equity perspective, recognizing that certain communities have uh, significant challenges, and as we're able to ameliorate those challenges, students are able to perform better in school and have a much more stable experience. Nowhere is that uh, more evident than how you've expressed some of the challenges in the Bronx as well. So we're really proud of the fact that we're investing in more social workers. We also are looking at and working with principals around how we're establishing more counselor positions there. Um, but that'll never be sufficient uh, because we, we do have a community schools approach. Mm -hmm. And as folks have asked me, what's your stance on community schools? I've said to them, as you look at a community, if you, if you see one community school, you have seen one community school. There is no cookie cutter approach. But the essence of a community school is that a community will identify what are the needs that, are, that exist in that community. And then how are you able to bring to the table, whether it's uh, municipal agencies or uh, uh, community-based organizations or local nonprofits that will meet the needs that are present within that community. So what we're doing is doubling down on our approach in community schools and especially in, in the schools in the Bronx where there are a number of needs. Uh, I've just started meeting with uh, our, my colleagues in DHS and what we're looking at is how are we gonna leverage our resources not only in terms of manpower headcount but also specifically braiding the services so that we're not duplicating uh, but we're multiplying our reach in terms of the schools that have uh, specific types of needs. That includes uh, schools that, you know, it may, be, it may be difficult to understand this in a city like New York City, but there, in certain parts of our communities, there are food deserts. Uh, and by that I mean students can't get nutritious, uh, nutritious food but for the fruit at the local uh, liquor store or bodega. So we, we absolutely take it very seriously about nutritious food in our schools. Uh, we are proud of the fact, I am proud of the fact that we have universal uh, uh, food nutrition for all of our students. It's free. It's not free, but we provide it, right? And I'm really thankful for the funding to be, to be able to make that happen. But we have breakfast in the classrooms. We have breakfast in our schools. We have breakfast and lunch in our schools ubiquitously across the, the system. We're also looking at how we're including a supper program for those students that uh, need that additional support as well. Uh, I will tell you that as I've gone across the city and done my listening tour, uh, my students, our students, have been very vocal about food and nutrition and what they think is good and what they think is not so good. What I will tell you is we've been sensitive to that, so we're forming an ad hoc student advisory that will meet with us and do taste testing so that we're getting multiple selections that are culturally appropriate, uh, but that are also good tasting. Uh, I'm very proud of the fact that our Deputy Chancellor Rose and her team around student nutrition are taking an approach where they're not only looking at what is the food that is being consumed, but they're also taking into account what's the environment in which that food is being consumed. So it's the aesthetic. So we all know that when we go for our coffee or for our little lunch and we meet somebody, we like to have a nice environment. We've, con we've started redoing some of the class, uh, the cafeterias so that 
uh, they are much more inviting environments for students to gather and have downtime and meet with each other. I will share with you an interesting tidbit, which is uh, probably psycholo more psychological than, than actually architectural. Uh, but in those environments where we've actually redone the environment and made them much more appealing, and when we surveyed students and said, what do you think of the environment? Students say, oh, we love the environment. And then on the same survey, we'll say, and what about the food? And they say, the food is better. And we actually haven't done anything different, right? So there is this, there is this connection to where you eat and how you eat and what the food looks and tastes like. Nonetheless, we still want to focus in making sure because we know that in many cases, this is probably the only meal students will have. We want to make sure that they're nutritious, but they're also appealing and appetizing to our students as we, as, as we provide that food. Um, the Renewal and Rise programs. So I, I was quoted uh, when I was entering about some concerns that I had with the Renewal program. I talked about a fuzzy theory of action. I talked about unclear goals. I talked about our theory of action and, and, and engaging the community. Uh, I'm happy to say that as I've now come on board and met with my colleagues in the Department of Education, many of those concerns that I had expressed publicly are now being already being taken into account. So you will see of the 50 schools that still remain in either a, in a renewal type approach, uh, there will be re-engagement that is going to hap happen with that school community and the community at large. And part of that is that I've, I've been unconvinced that we've really done as much as we can to engage not only obviously the exact school community, the parents, the teachers, the administrators, the support staff, but what we've done beyond the usual stakeholders. Have we engaged the elected officials like yourself? Do you know what the plan is for every single one of those schools and what the investment is going to be by the DOE mm -hmm. and then what the school community is going to be responsible for bringing to the table. Do our faith-based organizations in that community know what the plan is and what we're trying to do? Do our advocacy partners know what the plan is? Again, unconvinced that we have done that in, in, in terms of the the deep level dive that we need to, but you're going to see a re-engagement so that everybody's on the same page. Uh, and then as I've spoken several times in, in response to several questions, we're applying an equity lens to that particular issue. So it's important that as we identify what are the challenges that are getting in the way for students and uh, to show academic progress in those communities, we're going to invest and continue to invest resources in a targeted way to support the learning in those communities. But again, uh, uh, Council Member Gibson, to your question about RISE, so schools that have come out of the ICU, if you will, and are now just in intensive care, we can't afford to let go of some of those supports that we've put in place because without those supports and recognizing that those are addressing some uh, persistent issues that they have with being able to be uh, well-performing schools, we know that if you pull those supports away, they're going to fall right back. So we, we all also are looking, how do we continue to support our schools as we go forward? The fair student funding formula, again, becomes really critical because the more resources we have to directly invest in those schools, uh, the better we're able to stabilize those communities. And quite frankly, the better that we're able to look strategically about where our schools and school communities are, what is the programming, how are we providing opportunities for all students and all members of the community to access those programs, the better I think that communities will readopt their local schools. Uh, and that's what we want, good schools in every neighborhood that is a viable option for every student. Uh, so those are just some of the thoughts on the questions that you asked, and I'm going to ask any of my colleagues if they want to chime in on any of the other particular points. I think you answer them well. Thank, Thank you. you. I look forward to working with you and meeting with you. And in terms of support services, just want you to add suicide prevention counselors as well. I've been very big on that too. Um, great organizations that make sure that we protect all of our kids that may be suicidal. So I thank you. Look forward thank to working you. with you. And thank you, Chair Traeger. And thank you, Chair Drum. Thank you, Councilmember. And next, we have Councilmember Lander. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. 
Chancellor, wonderful to have you with us here this morning, and I really am encouraged by your testimony and by the leadership you've already taken. So when you say in your testimony, let's have the tough conversations, obviously you've shown you know, that you're really willing to have them, and I, I'm really grateful for it. Thank you. I'm going to follow the model, I guess, of, uh, of Councilmember Rose and others and just lay my questions out. I have three questions, and the issues that I've worked on uh, most in recent years have been school <coughs> segregation and air conditioning, so an unusual basket of issues, but uh, I appreciate the work you're doing on both. So in addition to being encouraged by your remarks, I'm really encouraged by the District 15 process that we have underway, and I know we've got our town hall with you next week, and I hope you can join us for the fourth public workshop uh, in that process, because it really has been having tough conversations and moving toward a more uh, thoughtful and more integrated District 15 middle school approach, and I'm encouraged by it. Um, it now looks like we're starting to put resources into confronting the challenges of segregation and racial inequity in some different ways in the implicit bias training and the culturally responsive education, in the resources provided to uh, bring WXY into the District 15 process, the SIP grants, but how those are being spent is pretty opaque to the council and they feel somewhat disconnected too. So either today or at some follow-up point could you get us both a more detailed report on that spending and a sense of how it's being coordinated to achieve uh, some shared goals? So that's question one. Question two on air conditioning. Um, you, uh, I guess there's, you conducted this survey that found 5,200 more classrooms than you had previously told us, the 11-6. Um, and so I'm trying to understand, I guess, a little bit like what accounts for that discrepancy, but more, will you guys give us an updated version of the report you provided in March that brings those 5,200 classrooms in and just clarifies how many schools need electrical upgrades? I appreciate the new money you're putting in, but again, I guess we would like to see a report and just be clear how many classrooms, which schools need electrical upgrades, where are they getting them, and how does that tie to the budget? And then third, I was also really encouraged by your enthusiasm about civics for all, something I also care a lot about, and in particular, participatory budgeting. Um, and I wonder if you've considered, or if you would consider, there's some amazing young leaders, high school students, who have helped lead the way from our districts in participatory budgeting, having a youth steering committee uh, to help implement that and bring their leader, you know, it, it build from their remarkable leadership as you implement the program. Thank you. So Council Member Lander, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna take on questions one and three and I'm gonna ask President Grillo maybe to take on two. Um, uh, thank you for your support. I think it's always important in a participatory democracy that uh, we endeavor to ensure that all stakeholders are represented and that all stakeholders have opportunity to benefit from the public schools. Uh, so I appreciate your support, uh, and I, I want to thank you for the D15 process. That the, the, the District 15 um, has not always received all of the attention, um, but they are doing some transformative work in a very real and grounded way. I'm very familiar of that. With that, I'm also very heartened by the district-wide uh, diversity steering committee that we have in place. Uh, I've, been, I've had the opportunity to, to attend one of their meetings uh, and address them. These are very smart, passionate, very committed individuals who have committed to bringing to us district-wide recommendations, some short-term and some long-term recommendations, and they've agreed to do this by December. So I think there is now a confluence of uh, many work strands that are coming, District 3, District 15, the work that's happening with the District-wide Diversity Council. So uh, just in time for the holidays, we're gonna have some conversations uh, in terms, and, and maybe, you know, it, I think it's important. So I wanna thank you for your support in that regard. Uh, you will continue to see us uh, working to uh, solidify that within the organizational structure of the DOE so that we can engage from an equity, excellence, access perspective with other advocates, other elected officials, and other representatives in our school communities. I think that's very important. Uh, and, I, and I will say this, at a time in our nation's history where there is a deafening silence from Washington, D.C. around enlightened educational policy. New York City has the opportunity and I think the, the firepower to actually set a national conversation on the table. 
and that's not lost on us either. So we want to make sure that we're not hiding from it, but that as we engage, we're doing it in a very systematic way. Uh, I think the idea of a youth steering committee around participatory government is brilliant, absolutely. Um, I was grilled, I have been grilled, with all due respect to our council members, uh, if you want to see a real grilling, you should have seen the t youth town halls that I had. Our high school students. students are definitely tougher than the, wow. any of the city council here. And well prepared, knowledgeable, specific, didn't let me get away with a thing, right? You're not either, but they were, they were very, very impressive. So wherever we can engage our youth and have the youth voice guide where we're going, I am a big fan, and we will absolutely take that into consideration and, and work to make that happen. Uh, air conditioning. Okay. Uh, <laughs> President Grillo. <laughs> Thank you. Um, to explain the discrepancy, uh, the original list was based on the 2015 principal survey. The updated principal survey included a number of other rooms that had to be included. Um, in terms of what buildings need electrical upgrades, we are still surveying these buildings. We're moving forward. We have, as they said, about 17,000 classrooms to deal with. So we expect to have, by the end of the year, to be complete with all of those surveys. We can give you an updated numbers now. End of the school year or end of the calendar year? End of the calendar year. That's when you'll have all the updated information. All the, we'll be able to have seen every single building. Okay, well, let's, we'll follow up with the chair and the staff and figure out what sure. will be the most useful update schedule that can have the most useful full information but also meets our timeline. So thank you. And then just on this issue of some budget transparency on the implicit bias, culturally responsive education, D15 and other expenditures of that type, which are largely new in the budget, which is, I'm, I'm thrilled to have those new resources in, makes it harder for us just to see them and know what's underneath them. So we can get some more details on that. I definitely think, uh, yes, we can provide you detailed uh, budgets and I think it probably is worthy of another conversation around how do we build a strategy around all of these things. So, but we can do that. Thank you very much and welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Council Member Barron, followed by Joe Nye. Uh, thank you to the chairs and thank you to the panel for coming. Um, in this country, we know that it was built upon the appropriation of the lands that belong to the indigenous people, and we know that it grew based on the exploitation of enslaved Africans, free labor. And every institution in this country has embedded racist policies in it, bar none. And I know that as we look at the Board of Education and we see how there have been improvements, there are still systemic, in my opinion, things that need to be addressed. We look at the specialized high schools, and even though we know that blacks represent 70% of the population, they only represent 11% in specialized high schools. And it's even less than that in the elite, the top three schools that we talk about. So I wanted to know, are you in favor? I've got a lot of questions, so I'm gonna run them down. Are you in favor of multiple criteria being used for selection at specialized high schools? You talk about social justice, and we know that we have instances of a teacher telling a student he could not, public school student, he could not do a report on Malcolm X because of Malcolm X's history and another teacher who told black children to lie down so that they could be stepped on so that they would know how it felt in the middle crossing. I want to know what kind of consequences those persons face, not the retraining, but the consequences that they face. In terms of locations, uh, I think the temporary locations where they're needed are fine. And I'm particularly talking about the East New York Family Academy, which will be relocated for, I believe, it's two years, perhaps three, with the Maxwell High School, because they're going to be getting, East New York Family Academy is getting a brand new building. Even though you want to force, uh, what do you call them? You call them uh, cafetoriums and something other, cafeteriums and whatever, which is a combination, which in my opinion, a high school needs a dedicated gymnasium. And that's what I'm pushing for, because the plans are not finalized there. But where other co-locations are forced on schools, the host school loses out. Two years ago, 
the Langston Hughes School was forced into a co-location with a charter school. The Langston Hughes School was promised that by that September, they would have their TV media room replaced, they would have their le uh, library and media room replaced, they would have their indoor gardening space replaced, they would have their music for the brain program accommodated. None of that has happened to completion. None of that has happened to completion and we're coming to the end of the second year. So I want to know how we're going to, as schools are forced to take on a co-located school, meet the promises that we make to sweeten the pot, to force them to go into something they really don't want to have. Uh, you've talked about AP classes. I'd like to know what the re results were for the students. What are the numbers? I haven't been able to find those numbers yet. Uh, we talked about homelessness, and we know that each school only gets $100 through the McKinney-Vento allocation. I want to know, do you think that's enough? to just rely on the feds to do that? Or can we dedicate money within the uh, city budget to address that as well? And finally, thank you, Mr. Chair. Finally, uh, in the middle schools, in the middle grades, there are still teachers teaching particularly math and science who are not certified by the state to teach math and science. And I want to know, what is that number? I've asked this question for years, and I've never gotten an answer. What is that number, and what can we do to address that? Because we know that as students are graduating with greater percentages, they are still getting into CUNY. 70% of uh, city schools go to, city high school graduates go to CUNY, and need deep remediation, which cuts into their costs of the uh, tuition assistance that they're able to get, and lengthens their time in, in college. So those are the questions that I would like for you to address. Thank you. Councilwoman Barron, thank you so much for your questions. Um, it's nice to see you again. Uh, so specialized high schools. Uh, in my career, I've been uh, part of a conversation where in specialized or specific admission high schools, we've implemented multiple measures for identifying student uh, qualifications to those schools. I will tell you in every single one of those inst instances, we have never uh, diluted the talent pool. Uh, in fact, we've increased the diversity and we've been able to, I think, strengthen those schools because they do have an influx of diversity. Uh, our approach here under my leadership as a chancellor will be no different. I want to cast the widest net I wanna make sure that we are providing opportunities for the widest array of students. And I'm gonna air underline what I'm about to say. These are public schools. These are not private schools. They belong to the public and as such, it is my philosophical and personal and professional belief that all schools should be accessible to all students in the city of New York because the city of New York taxpayers pay for those schools. So our approach will be to cast the widest net, provide the best opportunity to identify students that are eligible for those schools. Uh, in terms of uh, implicit bias training, um, I think the incidences, while I'm not familiar with the specifics of the incidences that you mentioned uh, in your question, uh, I think that begs the question uh, and actually is justification for why we're implementing implicit bias training, why we're investing in culturally relevant pedagogy and culturally relevant curriculum. I think it's incredibly important that we recognize that uh, race and class in our history is something that we should not stray away from. We have to recognize it. And as we recognize it, we have to talk about it. And in our classrooms, we should be uh, preparing all our students, our paraprofessionals, our teachers to be able to have that conversation in a culturally responsive and respectful way. So that's why we're investing in those, in those, uh, th th those uh, items and why we're gonna continue to increase the investment as we go forward. If I could just jump in. Sure. Where teachers don't reflect that training, what are the consequences that they will face? Well, it's unacceptable for any teacher to abuse a student. So we will follow up, and again, I'm not familiar specifically uh, with the incidences that you uh, mentioned. I will, 
actually follow up on my own to find out where that is. It's important to recognize, and I know that you do, that incidences that, that in which uh, any employee has been accused of unprofessional conduct are incidences in which disciplinary process kicks in. I can't talk about those publicly. But what I will say is that uh, we will never allow any adult in any environment to either act unprofessionally or in a misguided way or in any way, shape, or form that harms children and not follow up with the full, the full due process afforded in terms of the disciplinary process. Uh, in terms of co-locations, uh, in my entire career, uh, I have been faced with the issue of co-locations, usu usually uh, initiated because of state law that requires vacant space be afforded to charter schools. It happened to me in California, it happened to me in Texas, now here we are in New York. It's the same story with a different set of characters. Uh, I will tell you that the best uh, thing that we can do is to do the very investments that we're talking about. Building local community schools, building programming, strengthening the academic uh, portion of the, the school community, and making sure that the very community itself in many, in many situations changes their own narrative about their local school. I can't tell you even in the eight weeks that I've been in New York City how many times I've had conversations with community members in various areas where they will say, well, everybody knows that nobody's going to go to that school. They should be going to that school. Well, you create this self-fulfilling prophecy where people say, well, then why am I going to go? The community doesn't even want to go there. So when I talked about, in response to a previous question, we're re-engaging our communities in our historically underserved and historically underperforming schools, that's part of the reason. We want everyone to own the village. We want the village to be informed, so we change the narrative. But as we're changing the narrative, we actually want to do something to make those schools a, a destination that the local community wants to go to. As we build our enrollment, there is less uh, unused space, which then uh, is less space that is subjected to uh, co-locations as, as mandated by state law. So we're very much uh, sensitive to that fact. Again, I, I, I want to make sure this is public testimony. I want to make sure. The other question I get asked all the time is, are you pro-charter or are you anti-charter? I'm not going to get involved in that fight. That's a red herring argument. Are we about building good schools and really strong programming in our schools? Absolutely. I'll talk to anybody anywhere all day long about that. But in a co-location initiative, you have to build schools that are going to bring enrollment. And the best way to do that is to build strong programming in our schools. We're committed to doing that. But in terms of an eight-week timeline presented by your department taking two years, that's unacceptable. Again, so I, I wanted to know, you know, when now can we expect what was promised to be done in eight weeks to be concluded? So. Um, I believe, Councilwoman um, Barron, you're referring to the promises you referenced to uh, Langston Hughes. Correct. Okay, so I'm going to find out where we are with that. I may ask President Grillo to update us on where we are with that. My understanding is that those projects have been completed, but I'm going to ask... Well, the principal that's there has indicated only the library and media has been completed. And I was with them last week, so okay. there's much more to still be done. Sure. Well, and it's unacceptable that a school that had a prize program, their TV film studio, is still not up and running after two years. Great. So what we'll do is we'll make sure that our staff visits and we'll get an update to you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, in terms of AP classes, we will respond in writing to you in terms of the question that you asked about uh, the depth and breadth of that particular um, program and initiative for us. Uh, and then in terms of McKinney-Vento, again, we're gonna, I'm going to look into that. Um, McKinney-Vento is, uh, as you know, a federal designation, uh, but I think, as we've already talked about, the in investment that the city and the mayor is making in adding additional dollars to uh, serving our students in temporary housing, our homeless students, if you will, uh, I think is significantly more than that, but I want to get a, a precise answer to you. One last thing, certification of teachers in middle school? Yeah, I'm unaware of, of that issue, so I'm going to look into that. It's, again, 
Our, our teachers need to be certified. Um, so we're going to look into specifically, you mentioned the middle schools. So I want to make sure, uh, and you specifically referenced math and science teachers at the middle schools. We'll, we will also uh, get back to you with a specific written response on that. Thank you. Councilman Jolai. Thank you, Chairs, and once again, congratulations, uh, Chancellor. It's going to be very difficult to follow up on uh, Councilwoman uh, Barron, but I'm going to do my best. Um, in a city where we measure things by a New York minute, eight weeks has been a long time. <laughs> in essence, the honeymoon is just about over. Um, uh, but well embraced. There's so much to talk about, and whether it's keeping those school buildings open more hours in a day than they are closed, whether it be about the school food and why only 450 uh, out of the 530 schools have breakfast in classrooms, whether it be discussions of lead in water or lead paint that still exist in these buildings, mold and air quality that are impacting so many of our children. And in the borough of the Bronx, we have the highest rate of asthma, certainly a huge concern for many of my parents and the well-being of our children. Uh, from the head count of this administration, uh, where it may be too top-heavy, where teachers are still spending their own money for classroom supplies, lack of gyms that was mentioned, uh, overcrowding and fully funded school facilities, to school safety, and, and I love your directness, but I can't go back to my district and tell my parents that our school buildings are not the safest buildings in New York City. I need them to know that we're doing everything possible to prevent anything happening to those children in our classrooms. In spending gap in CFE and certainly after school programs. But I do want to talk to you specifically about the tale of two students, the demoralizing of our children, the dangerous conditions, and if you haven't guessed it yet, I'm headed to the trailers that we have in many of our schools. I understand that we have about 70,000 students that are in four PK, is that correct? Yes. yes. And now our three PK program is 19,000 by year 2021. That's correct. How many students do we have in trailers? We'll get you that number in a moment. While you look it up, I believe my recollection is about 2,800 students. And I, the 55 schools that you visited, I'm not sure if you've been exposed to the school trailer scenario. I, I've seen learning cottages, mm. which is another term is used, or temporary classrooms or portable classrooms. Trailers is another way of saying the same thing. Yes, I have seen them. Uh, well, these trailers are truly hazardous conditions, death traps. We won't talk about the inconvenience of having to put a jacket on to use a restroom or the yeah. lunchroom or to have to go to gym or any of that uh, through cold and snow and rain and heat where there's privileged children that are able to enjoy the same privileges inside a controlled setting. It's just so disturbing yeah. that there was a commitment by this administration in 2014 that committed and pledged to getting rid of all of the trailers by 2019. And today, best case scenario, we've removed 171. There are 84 more in the process. I don't know that process, that time frame. And 99 that haven't even begun being transitioned out. So I'd really like to have a firm commitment and understanding that we can't ask our children to dream big because all things are possible and create the tale of two students where there's, there's a feeling of demoralizing and a substandard condition that we are allowing to continue. And as thank you, Chair, for the extension. 
The budget, the executive budget of $32.3 billion equivalates to about $29,000 per student. That is twice more than, I believe it's California per pupil, and certainly much higher than any other major city in the country. To spend that kind of money, and it's the wisest investment that we can make, and for it not to trickle down into these classrooms and to the students is an injustice. And I'd love, I'd love to know what the balance, what the per pupil cost was in Houston and Las Vegas and compare the two and how is it that they're able to do so much more with so little and how we've invested and we keep throwing the money at the problem and the problem just seems to be getting worse. So thank you. Thank you, sir. I appreciate your perspective. Um, so to your question at the very end, you don't want to be in Houston. You don't want to be in Las Vegas in the per pupils. And I will very respectfully challenge that argument that they do more with less. Uh, Houston, when I left, was less than 9,000 per student. 9, less than 9,000 per student. In Houston, there were counselors, one for every 850 students. There were no social workers. There were very little to none of uh, school librarians. There were little to no uh, nurses in the schools. So I will challenge that assumption very respectfully because I live there and try to make ends meet. Uh, Las Vegas was even less. It was less than 5,000 per student. So the fact, and I've said it again, there is a cost of living in New York City, but even accounting for that, the fact that this organization, that this council and this mayor are investing the resources into game changers, 3K, pre-K, uh, equity and excel excellence and equity for all, college for all. Uh, we're investing in social workers, we're investing in counselors, we're investing in the number of, of initiatives that we are investing in here in New York City speaks to a very enlightened approach. Now, are there things that we can do better? Absolutely, there are things that we can do better. But if you're implementing a 3K program, you have to train those 3K teachers. Who's gonna train those 3K teachers? That could be considered part of the bureaucracy. I consider it part of the infrastructure to ensure high quality programming. If you're going to implement culturally responsive classrooms, that doesn't just happen. You need to train teachers and continuously provide support for teachers to be able to implement those initiatives. So there is an infrastructure that is important to be able to replicate good practices. Now, my goal is to come in with fresh eyes uh, and take a look at how are we implementing how are we organized to be able to not only implement what we said we want to implement, but also to partner with municipal agencies and other governmental agencies and community-based organizations, et cetera. Uh, part of that is us being prepared to do that as well. Uh, I know that, uh, and I haven't been fully briefed on this, but I know that there, the commitment towards removing temporary classrooms uh, is, is a real commitment. Uh, I'm gonna ask President Grillo in just a minute to give us an update of where that is and what the challenges are, and then how do we work together to actually make that real uh, in terms of whatever commitments have been made. Um, but the notion that I am so happy to hear you talk about, Councilman, is this tale of two children in our city. Uh, and as I've traveled across the city in eight weeks, I can also point to the tale of two children, uh, where children in the same grade level in different parts of our city are getting drastically different experiences every single day. And it's not only facilities, it's about academic programming, it's about opportunities, it's about social emotional learning and feeling comfortable in their classrooms. Uh, so we are going to be great allies as we work to eliminate that tale of two uh, uh, students in our city. But I do appreciate the passion and the questions and look forward to working with you. I'm gonna ask President Grillo if she can update us on where we are with the temporary classrooms. Absolutely, happy to do that. Um, again, uh, council member, you were correct in that we have removed 171 of these trailers. We began this process with three, over 350 trailers. Um, we've removed 171, we have plans to remove another 84, and as you said correctly, we have 99 still remaining uh, with no plan. But there's a reason for that, and the reason is there are children in those classrooms. Now, 
The issue is, where are those children to be relocated to? Because we have the money, we have the funding, the city has committed to providing the funding to remove these trailers. If there are children in those classrooms, we have to either send them to another school location where there is room or find room within their existing buildings. In some cases, that's next to impossible. Um, I, no, I agree with you on the challenges. Don't right. get me wrong. But it's very hard for me to accept those explanations when you found room for 70,000 for PK students overnight. I can explain that. And now you have an additional 19,000 three PK students in three years' time that you're going to find room for. And what is the number of children in those trailers? Again, I believe the number is at, uh, in the 2016 to 17 um, uh, school year was 5,800. So you, f this administration found room for 70,000 four PK students literally overnight and we're committed to 19,000 three PK students within three years, but we can't find a learning environment for 5,400 students. And my, the chair is very familiar with this, because I believe Chairman Drum uh, taught in one of these trailers for a number of years and has been at the forefront of this. Hmm. It's an embarrassment. There can't be an acceptable explanation, none, to the parents of those children or those children that are in those environments. You want to talk about school safety? There is no safety for those children. The unthinkable can happen to those 5,400 children and no one would even know because there is no metal detector, there is no sign-in book, there is no security. They can walk into these playgrounds, into these classrooms, and no one would even know for a period of time. There is a moral question here. There is a responsibility question here. 5,400 students need permanent placement in those structures yesterday. And the 84 that are in a phase of being planned out, I believe is a 10-year plan. Is that my understanding? No. That's the 84 not that. are being 54,000 or 5,400? 5,400. 5,400. The, the 84 trailers yes. are what is the time frame, the time frame for those, as well as the 99 that there is no plan? Okay, so, so uh, Councilman, we could not agree with you more in terms of the need to get rid of those trailers. We absolutely agree, and we are doing our very best to get, to get moving on them. There are two things that I did want to say. Those 84 are in various stages, meaning that, for example, if a school has six trailers in the yard, but we are able to build an addition to that school, we cannot get rid of the trailers until the addition is completed. So there are a variety of, of timelines for this. Some of these may be in design, or in fact, a new school may be built nearby where the trailers are, and rezoning will allow those students to go to the new building. So a lot of that depends upon the uh, construction schedules, design and construction schedules. The other option that, that is taken when we work very closely with the Department of Education on providing programs in nearby schools that might attract students so that they could reduce the enrollment and then get rid of the trailers. We're very anxious to get rid of those trailers. We, and in terms of how we compare that to pre-K, okay, first of all, the location of those trailers, um, I will venture to guess, are in areas that, or schools that are very overcrowded. So I would guess, and, and I believe, that the, you're not gonna find pre-K seats in that school building. Um, but the SEA's role in this 
was to find small locations where we could build, in, in fact, four classrooms for a pre-K with some play space attached to it. There are, for example, in a pre-K space, you're not building a cafeteria. You're not building a kitchen. You're not building a gymnasium. These are small locations and not adequate for the student body that's in the trailers now. Uh, council member, we have to wrap it up. We'll continue this afterwards. I'm sure we'll it's have. one that's a grave concern for me. Those same scenarios existed for 4PK and 3PK, and yet when there's a desire and a willingness, this administration has found ways to make it happen. There really needs, to, and I, uh, I will look toward you, Chancellor, to really address this injustice, and we'll talk offline again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Council Member Rosenthal. Thank you so much, Chair Drum, Chair Traeger. Great to see you, Chancellor and President. Uh, Chancellor, <coughs> thanks so much for registering to vote yesterday. That was so much fun and really your story and everyone's story was so inspirational. It's great effort. Thank you for that. You. I have two um, types of questions. The first are the first two are capital related sure. and then the last uh, three have to do with fiscal responsibility. Um, so in terms of capital, uh, the school accessibility issue is one that we've talked about a bit. And I'm wondering if as you are reviewing each of the buildings, you would allow for flexibility where perhaps very quick small changes to certain schools sure. could make a real big difference. Um, for an example, um, in my district, uh, for the O'Shea complex where the computer school is, a very small inexpensive lift that perhaps we could add to the staircase, just knowing the students who are there, would go a long way to accommodating um, those students fully, actually, um, so the kids wouldn't have to come in the back door. So I'm wondering if you would consider that. And secondly, with capital, I'm wondering, um, uh, President Grillo, if you're working, sharing what you've done with your MWBE program, which is so successful, whether or not the administration is picking up on your, some of the reasons it's been so successful, Parks Department comes to mind. And then in terms of fiscal responsibility, I'm concerned about three different things. First of all, in terms of Medicaid reimbursements, I know that um, you weren't here, Chancellor, but in uh, four, five years ago, we were looking at why Medicaid reimbursements were so low for OT and PT services. Um, actually, uh, Deputy Mayor Shores had came up with this great plan where he invested many more, um, I think it was iPads and training so that you guys could bill better. Um, and what I'm seeing here is even an exec, you're showing that you're gonna collect nearly $100 million in Medicaid reimbursement that you're not gonna collect. You're already only at half of that amount and how could you sort of from a fiscal response, A, fisc that's not fiscally responsible because you know already what's gonna happen, exec just came out. Secondly, and what are you doing to make it better? Um, secondly, in terms of parity, pay parity with ACS daycare centers, which by the way is the answer to the council member's question about where you're putting the 70,000 kids, it's of course in community-based organizations, but um, you know, given the pay parity problems, when it comes over, when they come over under the aegis of DOE, I hope you'll deal with that pay parity problem because the amount of staff that's lost at the CBOs, making them so um, uh, not steady, um, I'm hoping that you will address that issue. And then lastly, with the custodial operations, and this again goes to the fiscal irresponsibility issue, you know that at least $72 million needs to be added to the budget next year for custodial services. You had it in the money, the money in the budget this year. I'm, I'm not clear how you could convince yourself that you shouldn't put it in the, the money in the budget for next year, but that's more less for you, Chancellor, and more sort of fiscal 
issue. Thank you. Council Member Rosenthal, thank you so much, and thank you for being there yesterday. Um, I have to tell you, it's really refreshing to see uh, all of our council members, but uh, you in particular, everywhere I go, there you are. So thank you, <laughs> really appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna answer a couple of questions and we'll, we'll have my members and my colleagues will answer some specifics. So in terms of pay par parity, this is an incredibly important issue. And uh, as was mentioned, uh, the, the, the number of seats for pre-K and 3K um, can't just be within the portfolio of um, facilities in the DOJ. We are working with our community-based organizations. Uh, we talk about high-quality programming, and obviously the teacher in the classroom is part of that high-quality, uh, and it's an incredible factor for that. So it's very important to me, um, and I know it's important to the mayor, and I, I just want you to know that it is important. Um, so what I'd like to do, oh, the other issue in terms of MWBE, um, we consider that and I consider that also to be significantly important. Uh, every community in which I've served as a leader of a school system, we've taken an active look at how we're implementing that because that also is a matter of, I consider it equity for our community. Uh, and how that translates. So I'm gonna be diving a little more into that, and I know President Grillo has done a great job uh, with that particular issue, but we, we wanna learn, we wanna get better as we go forward. Uh, in terms of the other specific issues, I'm gonna ask if uh, not only uh, maybe Mrs. R Ms. Ramirez and Mr. Orlando can also take those, <coughs> any facilities issues, I'm gonna ask President Grillo to take those. Go ahead. Okay. Um, thank you, Council Member. Um, Yes, as far as the um, accessibility issue that you asked about earlier, certainly when we're doing our surveys, when the DOE um, under Tom Taracco is doing the surveys of the buildings, certainly those that require uh, minor changes to make the difference, um, we would, uh, of course, accelerate. They wouldn't require things like design and things like that, so, so certainly. Um, as for our MWBE program. Sorry, and can we follow up on that specific Absolutely. example? Thank you so Absolutely. much. Absolutely. As far as our MWBE program, we're very, very proud of that program. And um, we have a team of folks who work very, very hard to make sure it's successful. I will say this, that under Deputy Mayor Thompson, uh, he has his staff has been meeting with us regularly and has instituted a number of programs that replicate what the SCA does. So um, we're really excited. We had a program this past year called the Opportunity Academy where we took um, young people from community college and trained them in construction back office work. And the, it was so successful, we're doing it again. So similarly, other, mm -hmm. other agencies can do um, programs like that, but it certainly might not be related to construction, so they would have to formulate their own program. But they're very, very un interested. Okay, and so you're saying it's uh, Deputy Mayor Thompson, who's fairly new, is is now coordinating that Correct. effort between SCA and other agencies? Correct. Okay, that's a sea change. That's <laughs> great to hear about. Thank you. So I'll take uh, the question around the custodial services. Um, so, as you noted, uh, that there is a discrepancy in terms of the, the resources. We do anticipate having additional funding um, for, for the upcoming fiscal year, and hopefully that will happen for uh, the adopted uh, budget. This is an ongoing conversation. I, you're saying that you'll be able to slip in $95 million without blinking for so adopted? We're having additional, con we're having ongoing conversations with OMB and City Hall around how do we ensure that there are adequate services in all of our schools and making sure that our schools are clean and safe. Um, so we do expect additional resources in, in the budget. Um, at the end of the day, uh, this is their ongoing yearly conversations with OMB and City Hall to make sure that we are uh, making sure that we have our school buildings very clean. So they've held aside and reserved some money for this? Or is something, I don't understand uh, how that just slips in. I, I, I have a couple more projects I'd love to just slip in. I hear you. Um, this is, I mean, it's ongoing conversations with, uh, with OMB, and I'll happy to have a conversations with them in terms of where the resources are coming from. Okay, it just seems, I mean, okay. And then will it be baselined or year by year? 
Right now, we're looking at it from a year-by-year -year stance of, of just making sure of what, you know, what schools need and how, and there was an earlier question of how do we actually get cost savings. So it's year-by-year -year discussions around how do we uh, do, uh, have uh, more effective and efficient services. Okay. One, one of the things I hear you saying on that, though, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. is that there may be a redefinition of the jobs. Uh, like there was the last time where you had, super, we had um, custodians taking over two schools. Um, where they were only serving one in the past. Is that something that's under consideration? Is that? I think there are a lot of things on the table, but I think we're over. Let's Sorry, we're just. There is a custodian. There's a custodian for each building. There is the, and I, I might get the terms a little bit incorrect. There's like the the host school, and then there's usually some smaller schools associated with that. But there is one custodian for each building. But I can, I can, I'm happy to sit down with you and talk through and with the, you know, executive director for NYSIS to sit down and have a conversation around what does the services look like and the ongoing conversations that we have year to year to make sure that one, we're doing this efficiently and to make sure that there's enough money in the budget so that schools are clean. So what I'm hearing you say, though, is mm -hmm. that you, to make it wor work more efficiently. Yeah. Can you shed some light on what you mean by work more efficiently? I mean, this is... Uh, in the in initial uh, announcement around uh, NISIS, as you noted earlier, there was a goal to have some cost, some cost savings here. And so we're trying to assess what is the best way to do that um, in a way that does not actually have any detrimental effects on schools. And that has been, that's complicated, as you, as you might know. Um, and we'd, we want to make sure that we're not either harming the workforce and or making sure that the schools are not clean. So I, I do think it's worthy of having a discussion and a sit down meeting to kind of talk through the details of NISIS. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, if you could touch on the Medicaid reimbursement, because on that one, I, that too, uh, are you counting on the city just to make up for your not being able to collect that money so it's additional money that the city's gonna have to come up with for that? Again, then resulting in the fact that we have, because you're, you haven't, implemented the systems that we gave you everything you needed for four years ago, somehow that hasn't happened and now it's going to mean that some program that, you know, we would like very much to fund that actually would be helpful to students won't be funded because you're not getting the reimbursement that you're owed. I mean, either, you know, it's sort of one of those fish or cut bait things. You know, if you're just not going to be able to set up a system to collect the Medicaid revenue that you're owed, don't, don't tell us that you are, and we'll know that we can spend money on something more meaningful or whatever. Just be honest about it. No? Uh, so the target uh, for the current year is uh, $97.5 million, and we are... Uh, working very hard to collect uh, all of the money that we can from the Medicaid program. Uh, we feel like we've made a lot of progress on both OT, PT, uh, and speech. Uh, the target had contemplated in the current year, it contemplated that we would have a, uh, a been more successful uh, and more, more quickly at speech collecting services, um, but that uh, work uh, is actually ongoing. And we do have uh, time after the year ends. Uh, we have up to a year to bill for services that were provided in the previous year. Um, so we're hopeful that we'll meet the target. Okay. I, I just think it goes, it questions fiscal responsibility. And I don't know, it'd be great to really understand what, you're, what you guys are doing or not doing. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Council Member. We're going to, uh, the Chancellor has to leave shortly, so we're going to move along here, and uh, we have questions from C Council Member Salamanca, Kalos, Deutsch, and Cornegie, and then a, a follow-up by uh, Chair Traeger, and uh, we'll, we hope that you'll stay with us for that, and then I'm gonna, not, that'll be the end of it. We will not have a round two. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, Chancellor. First, uh, Chancellor, I wanna commend you and applaud you on your retweet back in April where you called out wealthy white Manhattan parents angrily ran against plans to bring more black kids to their schools. I thank you for standing up against segregation in our public schools. I, I, am, I thank you for this type of leadership uh, that you demonstrated, um, ensuring that all kids 
regardless of their race or their status, have access to the best public schools. And this is the type of leadership that we need in the chancellor, so thank you for that. Um, my, uh, my question here, there is a national conversation now on opioid and heroin overdose. And it's getting the attention now from more, um, it's getting national attention because overdose heroin is affecting more affluent communities. Uh, recently, the mayor announced uh, four locations for safe injection sites. And one of those sites are in my district and I am supportive of this. Um, I am working on the administration ensuring that we pick the right location for this site. Uh, but in my district, it's ground zero for heroin use, especially on 149th Street and 3rd Avenue. Um, last year, I introduced a bill which would require all public schools to have naloxone in stock in case that there's an overdose inside or in the surrounding areas of the, of the school. I immediately got resistance from the prior administration, prior to you, the prior chancellor and her team, um, because they had data that showed a very small percentage of overdoses in the last five years in public schools. Weeks after that, a special education teacher at the Bronx Public School 811 in my district, he passed away from an overdose, a heroin overdose in one of the bathrooms. And so I am reintroducing this bill and I am looking for support from the, the Department of Education now that we have a new chancellor. And I wanted to know what was your opinion um, on this? So thank you, Councilman, and thank you for your, your words of support. I, I am very appreciative of that. And uh, what you see is what you get. You'll continue to hear me at times be as blunt as a spoon, uh, but I think it's an important issue and I thank you for your support. Uh, I think it's important that we have all available um, opportunities to save lives, whether that's defib defibrillators at entrances of our schools to uh, CPR training for our employees. Uh, so what I would like to do is actually sit with you, learn more about uh, what your bill is proposing, and then work through how that could be actionable or not in, in our schools as we think about all 1,800 schools. I think that the opi opioid issue is an issue that is, I agree with you, gr of a growing concern. Uh, and so I'm really, really wanting to learn more about what that bill is and then how we can work together. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilmember Kalos followed by Deutsch and then Carnegie. Thank you, Finance Chair Drum, Education Chair Traeger, Chancellor Carranza, and President Grillo, and your amazing staff. Uh, pencils out. We have a timer and you don't, so here come the questions. Over the past four years, I've focused on overcrowding, building new school seats, civics, and hunger. On universal pre-kindergarten for three and four-year-olds, thank you for the new pre-kindergarten seats being built for this September. That said, how many four-year-olds applied for pre-K seats on the Upper East Side, and how many received an offer within one mile of their home? How many were offered seats more than two miles away? Many of the pre-kindergarten seats are offered in private child care settings, some of whom are represented by District Council 1707. Do these pre-kindergarten instructors offer the same quality and curriculum as public schools? If they are doing the same work, shouldn't they get paid the same rate? Over the past four years, I have asked the president of the School Construction Authority whether my district needs more seats, and I have been advised repeatedly that there is, quote, no identified seat need, and quote, feel free to interrupt and correct me if I am wrong. However, according to the School Construction Authority's Enrollment Capacity and Utilization Report, Manhattan, based on October 31st, 2016, audited registers, uh, the council Matic edition. El elementary schools in my council district have a target cap of 3,519 seats, but enrollment of 3,598 seats for 102% utilization. With my district's overcapacity and new construction planned or in progress, could the new five-year capital plan include more seats? Would the co school construction authority agree to reach out to every new development in my district, meet with the developer recording, regarding including new school seats in their building, and report on progress with my office? Would the school construction authority work with me, the mayor, and the city planning commission to create incentives for new schools with new construction? And Chancellor Carranza, with half of my seats serving the borough and city in schools that are almost entirely children of color across the street from schools that are majority Caucasian, would you commit to expanding integrated seats for the district? 
additionally, as you may know, lunch shaming is a real thing. It happened to me 20 years ago, and I'm so grateful to your predecessor for rolling out universal free lunch in addition to breakfast after the bell. And in our one-on-one -on -one brief meeting, I already mentioned it to you, but how do we move forward with guaranteeing every one of our public school students after school, supper, and fresh food to bring home to their families? On civics, after four years of asking, I'm pleased to see citywide voter registration of high school students on Monday, despite it happening on a Jewish holy day. Would you support legislation to mandate this valuable practice continue permanently along the same lines? Would you support mock voting in June and fall's elections? <laughs> well done. Well done, sir. Look, right before the clock. So again, I, it was a real pleasure to visit a school with you and thank you for being there. So lots of questions. We're gonna try to dive into some of them. Uh, and whatever we can't answer here, we will follow up with you in writing as well. Uh, around the pre-K seats and which are, which are the seats offered within a mile, within two miles, we will get back to you with that specific information. It's very district specific, so we'll get back to you with that information uh, ASAP. Uh, in terms of the supper, um, I, I, I think supper is an incredibly important um, option for our students. We know that many of our after school programs offer a supper option already to the schools in which they are placed, but I understand the, the urgency that you feel around a ubiquitous breakfast, lunch, and supper program. Uh, we're, we're actually looking into what that would look like. It's a cost issue, of course. Uh, but just like we've been able to find a way to have universal lunch and universal breakfast, uh, we, we, we're hopeful that we're going to be able to find a path forward for that, and we'll continue to work with you on that. Um, in terms of the other questions that were asked, I'm going to ask my colleagues to kind of jump in and tag team, because I think there were a number of them having to do with facilities and planning. Sure. Um, council member, um, appreciate the kind words from my wonderful staff. They are fabulous. Um, in terms of overcrowding, we've had this discussion before. I'm not going to make any great correction to that. However, I will say that there are a number of large new developments planned, and I think my staff has, in, has, has mentioned to you that we are in constant contact with those developers. So we, can, we will continue to do that. Uh, just yes, great. We, we're going to have to get back to you on the specifics. Your question around pre-K in your district, in terms of you said two miles away, I believe was your parameters. We're going to get back to you on those specifics um, uh, after this, after the hearing. What did we miss? Uh, pay parity uh, for the private and school-based sites. Uh, whether or not we could, and and then the whole civics piece. Yeah, so pay parity, obviously, we want to make sure that anybody that's working with our children that are, co are compensated appropriately, uh, that has been brought to my attention as an issue. Uh, and I'm working with uh, not only uh, our staff, but also the staff in the mayor's office uh, around that particular issue. But, but we agree, anybody that should be, uh, that's with our students, uh, we want to make sure that they're, they're being treated fair and responsibly. Around civics for all, thrilled about Civics for All. I think it's important that we're registering students. I know that the intent is to continue to not only register students, but have active participatory uh, experiences in government. Uh, mock elections, um, I have to find out what we're doing around that. Uh, I know in other districts that I've worked in, we've had mock elections and they've run pretty well. Uh, so let me find out what we're doing uh, around that particular issue in, in our school district and we can respond back to you as well. And I think the, the last piece is, so on the School Construction Authority, I'd like them to build more seats, but for you, uh, they build, you set the program. Half my seats are not designated just for my district, and uh, they now serve the entire borough, the entire city. Those seats tend to be almost entirely pe children of color, while the seats that only serve my district are majority Caucasian. Uh, how can we work on integrating those additional seats uh, or setting aside more for the uh, district in a way that can be integrated so you don't literally have segregated school across the street from segregated school? Yeah, that's the work that we're talking about, this whole issue of integration, segregation, uh, institutional barriers. 
Uh, I think you just didn't identified an institutional barrier. So that's, that's on our radar. Um, we will engage you in that conversation, but we're also gonna engage the local school districts, the local districts, the, the schools as well, uh, around identifying how we do eliminate those kinds of issues. I'm raising my hand. I'd like to work with you to integrate my schools. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Okay, thank you. Councilman Deutsch. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, so I'm gonna be very brief. Um, Councilman Michaela has just asked 51 out of my 52 questions. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna get down to it. So um, I had a conversation with administration beginning in January, and I had a conversation with you, um, Chancellor, just a few weeks ago when you were in my district. So um, I'm looking to um, see if we can add another two boxes, another two in, in the student application form, asking students if they are a child of a, um, a parent who's in active military, and in addition to that, asking the child if uh, they're a child of a veteran. Um, this helps in a number of reasons. Number one is that when a child is failing in school or a child may have issues, it may be too late to find out that um, the parent, a parent is a veteran, may be suffering from PTSD or other related issues. Uh, in addition to that, there are a lot of resources available for students, uh, children of veterans or students of, in, of a parent who's in active military duty and as well as um, there's also many resources for parents. So sometimes a veteran or someone who's in active military duty doesn't know what resources are available to them, so this way we could collaborate with DVS and, uh, and with, the, with the peer council, with the, with, the, with the counselors in schools to better understand and better know uh, which children are, are children of veterans or a child of active military servants going back and forth with your office in January. So I'm asking you respectfully if um, we can make this happen for this coming school year. Councilman Deutsch, thank you again for the, for the question. We've actually, I've actually um, elevated that question to our enrollment team about, um, it, it seems like a very straightforward request. Uh, what I've asked the team uh, to get back to me on is, oh, so let's say we identify and let's just say we have out of 1.1 million students, uh, let's just say we have uh, 5,000 that identify in those particular, uh, with those particular characteristics. Are we prepared then to have appropriate staff and resources to fully engage with that information, make the appropriate connections to federal authorities, state authorities, local authorities? Uh, do we have then the processes in place to, if a student is demonstrating uh, any kind of either antisocial behavior or less than uh, what we would like to see academic progress, how would we then intervene and connect people with those? So it, it seems like a very simple prospect, um, and, and I, I think it's a great idea. I wanna make sure that when we come back to you and say, yes, we can do this, or no, we can't do this, that we have the appropriate information so that we then have uh, the ability to think about then how do we make that happen. So uh, as I said, I've elevated that to our enrollment team. They're updating me on what that's gonna look like. I can't make a commitment that that'll happen for this enrollment season as we're already in essence in that enrollment season, but it is something that I'm taking very seriously and we've asked our team to be very thoughtful about. Okay, I just wanna respond with two, two quick things. Uh, number one is, um, uh, Department of Veterans Services. I'm sure they'll be willing to collaborate with administration and train uh, these coordinators. And number two is that the chancellor mentioned that you don't know if, if the school's prepared in case you come across a child who's not doing well because of a parent who's, um, who has PTSD. So if nothing is being done now, if we can't handle it, then we need to, you know, at least we have those services and we better understand those services by um, having that information beforehand because we can't just let the child go by saying we don't have the services. There are services available and we tend to forget that when this federal um, money is available for such things, we neglect it because the money is there, you know, big deal. It's more exciting to fight for the budget than to fight for money than to say, uh, you know, the money is there, you know, too bad, you know, let's, let's just go with the flow. So the federal funding is there. Uh, we have an agency, Department of Veteran Services, who, are, who have peer counselors throughout all five boroughs who could have a, a job, additional job to go out to the schools and train these people. Um, so 
I'm asking respectfully if we could make this happen for this school year. We cannot wait another school year if a child is not doing well to say we don't, we don't know what resources there are. So I thank you and I look forward to a, a response before school year. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. And I, again, I remain jealous of your voice. Yeah. Uh, that is an, uh, that, that, I want every one of our um, public announcement systems that we install to make us sound just like our councilman. So I, uh, the chair just gave me an extra three minutes to talk. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we share your sense of urgency, sir. Again, I, I want to make sure that as we respond, that we're responding in a very, very proactive, very systematic way to the responses. Implementation is key, and, and I understand that. I also want to be clear for those of us that are listening or watching us that any student that presents any kind of a difficulty, we have processes in place to assess how are they doing, what's the root cause of that. Uh, so we're not letting any student go, but this is just another layer I think that could be very useful. We just want to make sure that we're informed as we engage about what the what uh, what our our capacity to implement this school year is, and if we make the promise we're going to do it, we can actually deliver on that. Thank you, and I, I just want to—I'm I'm also want to check to see how many um, school children are currently in college, and who don't know what resources they're available, and and are paying off a student loan when, in fact, they may be eligible for that scholarship um, as being a child of a veteran. So. That is also one of the points, it's not just in the child, but also giving the resources to the children and as well as to the parents. So the services are there, uh, there's an agency there. So that's one out of three things you just mentioned that we need to figure it out, but um, being proactive and getting this information over can hurt, it can only help. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember Carnegie. Thank you, Chair Drum. Uh, good afternoon and welcome. Uh, Chancellor Carranza. Um, unfortunately, my office has not been able to effectively coordinate a meeting between us, and so I'm going to take some of my time just to let you know what issues are germane to my community and the city uh, at large that we'd like to address. Uh, firstly, I'd like to piggyback off of what um, Councilmember Barron began the conversation around um, parity in the specialized high schools. Um, we believe that we have a very simple solution. I'm wondering if you know you, you'd, you'd entertain it, which is uh, we know that we could double the enrollment in specialized high schools for minorities uh, just by um, doing what some schools across the country, some higher, uh, higher institutions are doing, uh, uh, primarily um, Ivy League schools, which are allowing merit-based entrance, uh, which is not away from the exam. For example, if just uh, every student who was a valedictorian or salutatorian in junior high schools who, was, uh, who wanted to attend uh, could attend, we would double the enrollment. Uh, the funny thing was when I suggested this m several years ago, I had uh, a very high ranking uh, person in DOE say to me, no, we can't do that because uh, the valedictorian in East New York uh, doesn't have the same uh, academic background as the valedictorian in Prospect Heights. And I said, well, explain. They said, well, uh, in, in East New York, what they'll do is uh, they'll base it on attendance and, um, and uh, how they work socially in their community, not on academics. And, and I said, I, I, I hope you say that out loud at some hearing that I get you to, because it's that kind of uh, uh, parity that we're trying to fight for. So um, that's, that's one concern that I have about the specialized high schools and the pathway ultimately to Ivy League colleges. Um, which um, I, I represent Bedford Stuyvesant and Northern Crown Heights, and all of uh, we, we're facing a, a tremendous brain drain because all of my best and brightest students are now forced to go to other communities to be educated because CC16 um, lacks uh, some of the foundation necessary to be a guidepost and a pathway to those schools. Um, and then the second thing I'll get to, uh, which is another pathway, is gifted and talented programs. Uh, prior to your arrival here, we had uh, kind of a, a knockdown, drag out fight with your predecessor around gifted and talented. And she, ha she made a valid point. She said she'd love for the entire DOE to be comprised of gifted and talented schools. And I said, unfortunately, in the borough of Brooklyn, uh, CEC 16 at that time had no gifted and talented program, zero. And, the CE and CEC 21 had 13. So they were creating a pathway and had insulated themselves in a way that they created a pathway to, to higher education, to the specialized high schools, and we had created a, pa a prison path, path, a prison pipeline. Um, so summarily, she relented, and we began 
to implement in all of the minority communities around the city gifted and talented programs. So now uh, in my district, uh, where CEC 16 resides in Bedford Stuyvesant and Crown Heights, we have one gifted and talented elementary class and one gifted and talented junior high class. But they're tremendously under resourced. So my parents are not willing, even if they live in the area, because they can make comparisons to other gifted and talented programs across the city, and the resources have not been allocated. So we were given it in minority communities in the South Bronx, in Southeast Queens. In, in Bedford Stuyvesant and East New York, we were given the gifted and the talented programs back, but a shell of themselves in comparison to their equals around the city. I wanna know if you'll look at the resourcing. So anecdotally, I'm telling you they're under-resourced because I visit them. And what they're supposed to provide in an academic pathway, they don't provide, and the administrators and the teachers are telling me that they're under-resourced. And when I visit District 21, I can see evidently, it is evident to me what, what a gifted and talented program should look like and what resources should be available. So uh, there was an effort made, which I commend the DOE for doing once they realized that there were no gifted and talented, first of all, there were no gifted and talented programs for the last two decades in minority communities. And under your predecessor, she allowed for them to be restored, but they're, 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 they're under-resourced. So I'm, I'm asking for a commitment to look at those gifted and talented programs to get them resourced appropriately so that parents can do for their children what they'd like to do. Provide an excellent level of reading, writing, and arithmetic, but the socialization that's, ne that's necessary for them to live, work, play, and be educated in their own communities. So Councilman, again, thank you for uh, the issues that you've brought up. Um, I've spent a lot of time in Bed-Stuy, Crown Heights. I'm sorry we haven't been able to connect, but. Uh, it's no difficulty to get in touch with me. So I'm, I'm, after this, I'm gonna make sure you have my scheduling person so we can spend some time together. Would really welcome that conversation. Uh, in terms of specialized schools, thank you for your recommendations. I have to tell you that uh, what you've shared has made it onto my uh, radar um, as uh, some potential. Um, so uh, again, as we've had conversations with lots of different folks, uh, in the city as I have, as I've come into this uh, conversation. Uh, I want you to know that that idea has been brought forward as well, uh, and it's part of a portfolio of possible fixes. Uh, one of the uh, issues that continues to vex us, and I think it's important just to mention, is that at least uh, in some of these specialized schools, there's state law, which now uh, regulates what is exactly required. I've never seen that. In, in all of the states I've ever lived in, I've never seen where there's state law that specifically requires a certain entrance exam for students in a public school system. I've just never seen that. So that's a different uh, variable that I think we can work together to, to address as well. Um, but we are looking at that particular issue. Uh, the mayor is very interested in that issue as well. And I want to thank you for your uh, advocacy around making sure that all schools are open to all of our students. In terms of gifted and talented, I'm, I'm happy to hear and I understand that there's at least one, and this sounds horrible, there's at least one in every district. Uh, I, based on your comments, I understand why that's important based on what the, the recent past was. Uh, our commitment in terms of how we utilize our resources from an equity perspective falls squarely within the concern that you have raised here today. Uh, if we look from an equity perspective, where are the communities that have historically been underfunded? Where are the communities that have historically been underserved? Uh, we have as a guiding principle, um, and one of my guiding principles is how do then we equitably distribute resources so that students and communities are being served in their communities? Uh, that is a guiding principle, and I'd look forward to working with you on how we go forward, but that's also something that is important for us as well. I think it's also important to, you know, my career, almost 30 years now as an educator, um, I've seen a lot of permutations around gifted and talented, and, and I want to make sure that when we're talking about gifted and talented, that we're talking about gifted and talented programs that are truly serving needs of gifted and talented students, and not programs that are monikers for others, the adults. My child's a gifted and talented student. I have 30 programs in my district. I wanna make sure we're serving students. 
And if we're student, serving students and they require a gifted and talented program because they are truly gifted and talented, then we need to be investing in those kinds of programs ubiquitously across the city. Uh, in some cases, that may mean that we may have to re-examine our portfolio of what those programs look like. Um, but again, in my general comment that I've made today, and I want to be very clear about what I'm saying, we should not use either programs that, that are um, school-based, programs that are city-based, like schools and entrance to schools, as filters for who gets in and who gets out. Uh, I think that that is just fundamentally, uh, in our democracy, undemocratic. Uh, so I look forward to working with the city council and my colleagues in the Department of Education and, quite frankly, the community around identifying where are those either intentional or unintentionally uh, established barriers to all students having access, and then working very aggressively at, at eliminating those barriers for all of our students here in the city of New York. I, I will just, I'm sorry, uh, Chair, I will let you know that on the gifted and talented front, um, we've done a lot. I want to work with you on it, meaning um, there are some communities who find a way to insulate themselves by having ancillary programs that support gifted and talented, and we don't have that. So we've been working with the National Society of Black Engineers in my community, which does uh, test prep. Um, there's test prep available in other communities at a cost that, you know, we don't have the resources to do. So I'd like to talk to you about resourcing even the test prep portion of it to, to get students up to speed who may not have identified clearly as gifted and talented, but with the right resources could be identified. So that's a second level to it. And I just want to say that uh, your predecessor uh, also did something that we appreciated in the academic sphere, which is to change the on-ramp from kindergarten to third grade. We believe that that was a disparity that really uh, uh, negatively impacted communities of color going in in kindergarten. It was about language. It was about, but third, by third grade, you should be able to recognize uh, students who may have an acumen that suggests that they are gifted and talented, as opposed to a kindergartner where that's just language. So it's what the so it's what the vocabulary in the household is, and those kinds of things. So there were there were questions about even the exam, which. Um, which your predecessor addressed that I appreciate. I think that there's more that can be done. Um, myself, my community, uh, the education committee that I sit on are willing to work to make sure that we can bring parity, not just put it on the DOE. Uh, we sit poised, ready to work with you to make sure that every student can have an opportunity and every student can have the potential to be gifted and talented. So Councilman, we're, we're singing off of the same hymn book, so I appreciate that and look forward to working with you uh, and look forward to meeting you soon. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, um, I have to just get my little piece in here as well. I mean, this is the problem with, with standard, high stakes standardized tests to begin with, is that, um, you know, do they really measure uh, true giftedness or true, uh, you know, learning ability? Um, you know, um, uh, I, th I believe that for the, for the uh, admission into kindergarten g and it's based on one test, if I'm not mistaken here, right? So, uh, and then, you know, <laughs> Does that really measure true giftedness? And, and, and should we be using like Renzulli me uh, measures of G and T, which to me is the real measure of gifted and talented um, students? But, um, you know, at, at, at those high stakes standardized tests have always been culturally biased, and to base admission into programs just on those alone, in my opinion, is not something that we should be engaging in. Anyway, let me turn it over to our chair, and I thank you so much. We're going to close it out with him. Thank you, Chair Jerome. Yeah, I, I will not get on my soapbox about testing, although I have a lot to say on that subject. And but I do appreciate, Chancellor, your your connection to our concerns on, on, on the issue of high stakes testing. Um, in a previous hearing, Chancellor, uh, Deputy Chancellor Rose minimize the impact that overcrowding has on instruction in schools. Uh, I'd like to get your take on uh, whether or not you believe an overcrowded school, an overcrowded classroom, does that have a negative impact on instruction in class? Thank you, uh, Chairman Traeger, and, and I will say to both chairs, uh, I share your concerns about the bias in, in single tests. Uh, that's another conversation for another day. Uh, you know, my experience as a teacher was such that at one point in my teaching career, I had a classroom where I had 46 students in my classroom. Uh, and that was probably one of my five classes that I taught. 
Um, and I know that in subsequent years when I had anywhere from 25 to 27 students, which in some cases people say that's still a lot, uh, I could actually do a better job. I could pay more attention to students. I could actually differentiate from my students. I could actually know where my students were in terms of their learning progression. I could implement and innovate because we weren't crowded. So while it may not seem like it's significant because it's, uh, you know, it, you, you still have curriculum, you still have a teacher, you still have materials. Uh, I think the, the learning environment is important. And, and I think that as we look at the, con the, the constraints that we have around making that happen, uh, I know that if I was to say to, um, uh, to President Grillo, you have an unlimited checkbook, fix it. She would fix it. Uh, and unfortunately, <laughs> operative word being if. Uh, but, but unfortunately, uh, many of these issues, especially as it pertains to facilities, have to do with funding. Uh, and I know that uh, there's, uh, you, there's been the expressed sentiment that, you know, we just can't throw money at the issue. Money isn't a solution. I, I just wish once in my career somebody had thrown money at the issue. Um, we could fix a lot of things. So th in my perspective, my professional experience, the issue of facilities and the facilities appropriateness for the instructional purpose are inextricably intertwined. Uh, so as we look at how we go forward, uh, we will be working very closely. And I have to say, uh, President Grill has done a phenomenal job with managing this portfolio of, of real estate and on our capital plan. Uh, but we're going to be very focused on making sure we're ameliorating those issues of overcrowding, that we're being very proactive around how we're planning for new seats. Uh, and on the instructional side, we're going to be very, very aggressive at providing the structures, the supports, the professional development to grow our academic programs so that there is no seat untaken because people want to come to our schools. So I really appreciate your answer to that, to, to this question, because this, this does mean a lot to us as a committee uh, and, and as edu educators and folks who believe in, in public schools because we were told by the Deputy Chancellor that some of the most successful schools in New York City are greatly over capacity. And my response to that sentiment is that success has to be within reach to all and not to some. And I, as a former teacher, I remember if I'm being observed and I have a class of over, you know, definitely over 30 kids, but only five or six are asking this, or I'm, being, I'm only calling on five or six kids or only hearing from five or six kids, that's not truly accountable talk. We want to hear from more kids than that. So we have to make sure that success is within reach to all and that we're not letting any kid, any kid fall through the cracks. So thank you, Chancellor, for, for that answer. Uh, quick question on... I mentioned before about community schools, and I agree with your sentiment exactly that each community school is a community school. There's no cookie cutter approach. Agreed with that. What is the current number of community schools that we have right now, right now in New York City, and is there a plan to increase them? We're currently around, and I'm going to correct, but approximately 220 community schools right now. And is there a plan to increase that number? I think with a, you know additional resources, of course, we would have like to have conversations around how do we get more community uh, resource coordinators in our schools. I think the chancellor would probably note that some of our schools are doing this kind of on their own. I know that they, um, without additional resources, and I know that folks are looking for kind of a resource coordinator to help um, kind of get the resources within communities. It's ongoing conversations with OMB around how do we uh, expand uh, the community schools program. Because I will tell you, this is a part of the answer to my original question mm -hmm. at the start of the hearing about how can we best meet the social emotional needs of students. This is a part of the answer as well. And um, and, and and there are, and I appreciate your, your, your acknowledgement of different approaches and strategies. There's the community learning school strategy, which is very, very hyper-local based, which really taps into the local community, which I think we need to uh, learn from and, and, and build on. So. This is an area that I like for us to work together on as well because y you're going to hear me sound like a broken record about social, emotional, academic. I think that they're all intertwined. I think that we are teaching to the whole child, not just to a, an exam. 
that is that's very very important to me. Um, quick couple other uh, quick questions. I, with regards to I, I heard before testimony about the anti bias training. Uh, so. Uh, it's my understanding all DOE staff will be required to undergo anti-bias training over the next four years with additional funding included in the exec budget. Will this include school safety agents? Uh, this is for DOE staff. So school safety agents are on the NYPD, um, on NYPD's payroll and NYPD staff. I, 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 th I will get back to you in terms of I know NYPD has their own plans around anti-bias training um, and I would be curious to see if they're also implementing with school safety agents. So this would be for DOE employees, um, as you noted, and our goal is to get to 142,000 of our staff in the next several years, um, and it would be providing procession for all of the, our, our staff so they can get that training. But would you agree that it's important that this type of training be extended to all folks working in a school building? Chairman Traeger, what I would say to you is that every single person that works in a school site should be trained. I think it's an important, if nothing else, what it does is provides us with a common language, a common lexicon uh, through which we can have these sometimes very difficult conversations about how we're serving our students and what our expectations are. So everyone from the school safety agents to our food and nutrition workers, to our custodians, to our <coughs> teachers, our paras, our principals, everyone would benefit from this kind of training. Thank you, Mr. Chancellor. And will the anti-bias training provided to DOE staff include issues around sexual harassment and abuse? My, absolutely. I think that's part of creating a safe and supportive working environment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, for, for that answer. Um, I also just want to touch on the issue of, uh, very quickly, on the issue of school maintenance budgets. Um, we heard before, Chancellor, about universal you know, uh, lunch and more breakfast in, the, in, in breakfast in the classroom. And that also means that there will be spills in the classroom and there will be sometimes incidents where folks have to better maintain. Um, you know, the DOE posts budgets at the school level on its website, uh, including the formulas used to determine school funding levels such as FSF. However, there's no similar transparency on the allocation of buildings custodial operations budgets. Uh, not even custodial engineers can see the factors that determine their building's custodial budgets. Will the DOE commit to making the formulas for determining custodial allocations in schools public and provide the council with a list of custodial allocations to each school, including the factors that determine each allocation? I do think that this is, I think we should have a broader meeting with, with yourself, uh, Chair Traeger and Chair Drum, around the NISIS and the custodial spending, just so we can have a deeper discussion around how the resources are allocated. We have, obviously, when we built out this nonprofit, we have more insight around how budgets are spent within individual schools. <clears throat> but at this time, I can't provide you with the details of, of, of how and when we're going to um, give that information out, but I would love to have, sit down and have a conversation with you about that in the future. Right, because so far, <clears throat> what I've learned so far, and I like to learn more, mm -hmm. is that they look at the size of the school, square footage, yep. which, which I understand, yep. but w w what I did not hear is that mm -hmm. they take the age of the school into account. Uh, I have schools in my district that were built with money from the New Deal, yep. but have not seen <laughs> big, in big upgrades since the New Deal. Um, it's like, that's one of our newer buildings. Yeah, exactly. yeah no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this is an issue. I, I do think that the age of a building needs to be factored in, and I'd like to learn more about how, how we, but do you, are, are we, because this is an issue that I just want to be clear on. Are there cuts to, are there any cuts to maintenance budgets of individual schools right now? So n no, there are no cuts. There, are, there have been situations where we've had to reallocate resources within schools around specific spending lines within the custodial budgets, but there are no cuts. Um, and we do expect to have ongoing conversations with OMB, and we do this. We want to do this yearly to ensure that there will be no impact to, to the cleanliness of our buildings. Um, so I, those conversations are ongoing. All right. So this might have been asked before because the DOE is uh, <coughs> in fiscal 2018. The DOE is spending 684 million dollars on the contract with mm -hmm. NISIS. Uh, however, the financial plan projects spending 612 million dollars. Right. Um, is this an accurate? We do, um, this is, we're still having conversations with OMB, but we do uh, expect additional resources uh, so that we uh, will not see any cuts to schools. 
Okay, I'm just going to close by just a few mm -hmm. quick comments, just sort of like the summary, uh, yeah. the, 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 the wrap up. Um, Chancellor, I appreciate, again, the theme that you mentioned before about schools historically underfunded, underserved. Um, I, I also want to just bring to your attention the impact that still has today. Um, we, we discussed this in terms of numbers, but I also want to make, make sure that we understand in terms of perception in our communities. When we talk about enrollment, we talk about schools that have difficulty, you know, people who work really hard in these buildings but still suffer from, from enrollment gaps. And this was one of my issues when I had a hearing about the renewal school program. Um, schools need help from the DOE to get the word out about the good work that they're doing inside those buildings. They need help for a lot of reasons. First of all, they are doing good work. The public deserves to know about it. But there's, there are also private, privately funded, big funded agendas out there looking to really, I think, denigrate their, their good work and looking to just continuously, you know, just stereotype public schools and say that they're failing and that they're horrible. And they're also reaching into multi-ethnic media outlets uh, where I, I, from the Russian-speaking community, where they have gone on Russian radio to bash public schools to try to send kids, for example, to charter schools. And I share your view that kids are our kids, whether they go to public, uh, district public school or charter school, these are our kids, we want to serve everybody. But I take issue when someone calls my student failing, or when my, someone calls my school a failing school. I take issue with that as well. But our schools need help. And how can we help, you know, use the DOE's public relations arm to support individual schools to deal with issues of perception? H has, have you given this any thought? So Chairman Traeger, Traeger I, I appreciate the passion. I'm, I'm right with you. Uh, I, I was recently at an evening event uh, which was um, a lot of uh, CEOs uh, in the city, and I was uh, a little shocked by some of the preconceived notions where, uh, I gotta tell you, I rolled up my, my sleeves, put on my boxing gloves, and went, went at it with these folks because there is this perception that traditional public schools are failing, and I, and I absolutely defy that definition. So I'm with you. Um, we, as a school system, quite frankly, are not organized to be a marketing firm. I'm just gonna say that. And the reason I say that is that in other school systems that I've led, we've come to the realization that we are in a market and that there is tremendous marketing dollars in other sectors of the education field that are specifically not just promoting those options but are denigrating our portfolio of schools. So I do think there is an opportunity and a need for us to take a marketing approach and really market the good things that are happening in our schools. I will tell you that some of the schools that perhaps the reputation is you don't want to send your child to that school, and I've walked those schools to the councilman's uh, uh, point in bed um, and I've seen some of the most incredible teaching that is happening in those schools. Uh, and I think that's something we need to celebrate. Um, so w with, with your support, uh, and as I work with my colleagues here, and as I enter this role, do not be surprised if we do not uh, come back at some point in the future with a marketing plan for New York City's public schools. Uh, and really, really work with not only our philanthropic partners, some potential private uh, public private partnerships around really celebrating what the good things are that are happening in our traditional New York City public schools. Sometimes the opportunity to be uh, from an external experience and come into the city um, is a real benefit. And as I am, as as I was reminded, the honeymoon's over. I get it, uh, but I still bring with me that fascination that incredible optimism as I go into our communities and see different schools in New York City and I compare that to what my experiences have been in other communities and the level of dedication, the level of funding, the level of investment, and I compare that dichotomy, we are in an incredible position. So I agree with you. Let's celebrate. Let's lift it up. Let's lift up educators that are doing, in, in many ways, God's work in some of the most difficult circumstances, but students are learning and communities are vibrant. 
Um, and that is going to require us to think a little differently about the, 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 the old paradigm of the school system just kind of chugging along to this school system that's not only doing remarkable things for students and building communities, but we're going to celebrate that. We're going to show it. We're going to market ourselves. We're going to talk about what we're doing. We're going to talk about the people. I think that is something we should be very, very proud of and we can do together. I, I greatly appreciate that answer. And I was past the budget note. I just wanted to just respond to earlier, just very quickly before. You mentioned before that there are no cuts to the maintenance. I, I'm being told that in the executive budget uh, that there's a cut um, uh, actually, what I'm reading here is that the released on April 26, 28 contains a cut of 99,768,135 from fiscal year 28, 2018 to the, to the budget for school facilities. Um, are, are you disputing those numbers? Can you speak to that, please? That yes, there. That is the the delta between last year and, and this fiscal year. We are. This is where we're having conversations with OMB to ensure that um, that our that our schools are not impacted. But there, are, but there are conversations ongoing with OMB, and, and folks really understand the concerns there. Yeah, but just respectfully, I don't know how the schools will not be impacted with that type of cut. That, that, that is significant, um, and I just don't want to make sure, because one of the things mm -hmm. we have to value in education is the physical space. Yes, And it's clean, course. it's safe, and this is something that we would like the administration to prioritize. No cuts to our maintenance budgets, especially there's been no cuts to education uh, in this budget, so we should not see that suffer in, in, in our schools. Um, the last uh, point I'll make, uh, Chancellor, I have a bill that's, uh, it's making its way in the council just to bring it to your attention on the, uh, on the issue of equity. Um, I applaud, I really applaud uh, those schools that have active and really engaged, uh, whether it's a PA, PTA organizations, alumni uh, or organizations, that's extraordinary. We should celebrate them and applaud them. What I also recognize is that there are certain communities that don't have the capacity to raise the type of dollars that some of these very active PTAs, particularly in, say, wealthier neighborhoods, have. And, and I, I've, I've heard anecdotally that sometimes PTAs could raise over, up to a million dollars, or some alumni could raise over, over a million dollars. And that will fund air conditioners in a school, and that will fund debate teams, and that will fund some of the clubs and the activities that and that school possesses. But schools in neighborhoods that don't have that type of wealth and that type of money don't have that type of capacity. Just wanted to get your thoughts on this because the bill that I have would just create transparency. That we would ask the DOE to share with us the the PTA and PA uh, numbers of how much money is is being raised to make sure that equity is felt across the board in New York City. So, so Chair Traeger, um, that is also one of those items that is universal everywhere I've, I've worked. Um, and you have uh, the privilege in some communities of being able to raise significant funding, which we know then affects the programming, it affects the physical plan, it affects extracurricular, it affects everything. While we don't besmirch any parent community, uh, the ability to be able to raise those kinds of funds, I think transparency is always important. And transparency becomes even more important when we talk about from an equity perspective, why there's going to be certain communities and certain uh, schools that are going to get different levels of funding based on the challenges. Uh, my understanding is we, and we can clarify, we don't actually collect that information from our PTAs, PTOs. So we'll verify what, how would we be able to even collect that information, what mechanism would that kind of look like. Um, but I will, I, I, will sh I will share a story with you. I hope you don't mind. Um, in one of my past experiences, when we talked about equity, and I, I've used that word I don't know how many hundreds of times in, during this testimony, uh, but in one of those communities, I was having a very difficult conversation with a community where we had just announced that we were going to be investing resources in historically underfunded communities, and because of that, the base allocation was going to be greater in another community, which would be considered one of those communities you don't want to send your kids to but we were really working to build up that community. And I went to a town meeting or a community meeting in, a, in the community where they were going to see a reduction 
in their base allocation. But we knew that there was incredible resources that parents and that community was raising external to the base allocation. And I remember that a parent took me on and said to me in very un no uncertain terms, how dare you take the funding from my child in this school and send it to another school? You are disadvantaging my child and you are advantaging another child and that's just un-American, that's not okay. Um, called me every name in the book. And after about five minutes of trying to make the case of why there are inequities in the system and that if all schools are able to rise, then the entire system rises and we are living up to our commitment to the community. Uh, and this parent said, absolutely not, that is not acceptable. And I finally said to the parent, I understand, I get it. Money is important. And she said to me, that's what I've been trying to tell you for the last 10 minutes. But money's important, so what I did is I said to this parent, here's my business card. I want you to call me tomorrow morning and I will guarantee your child a seat in one of those schools where we're sending the additional resources to because money's important. I have yet to receive a phone call or an email <laughs> from that parent. So I think this issue of resources is an incredibly important issue and while we don't besmirch anyone the ability to raise additional resources, I think it is important to have a clear picture of what, is it, what are the actual conditions in each one of those communities because then when we as a Department of Education, we as you as the city council, the mayor as the mayor, advocates for an equity allocation, understanding that there are challenges in communities, then we're all very clear and sober about why that should be something that we think about. So I would love to meet with you, learn more about your bill, and then actually examine how we can continue to work towards transparency. Oh, thank you, Chancellor. This was a, it's almost like a marathon hearing. You've <laughs> stayed the, from beginning to end, and that says a lot about your leadership and your, your leadership uh, style and approach. And it, it, it feels good to have an educator continue in the helm, and we have been greatly impressed uh, up this point, and with your musical uh, <laughs> abilities as well and talents and your connection to kids and our schools. Thank you very much, Chancellor, for, for today. Yo también quiero agradecerte para venir a esta audiencia hoy día con nosotros y para gastar tan mucho tiempo con nosotros aquí. Es un placer para tenerse aquí con nosotros hoy día. Thank you very much for coming. It's been a pleasure to have you and for spending so much time with us. Thank you very much. Thank you to the panel. Thank you. A true honor and thank you for the opportunity. Thank, thank you. you. Now, this concludes our hearing for today. The Finance Committee will resume executive budget hearings for fiscal 2019 on Thursday, May 24th at 10 a.m. in the room. On Thursday, the Finance Committee will hear from the Office of Management and Budget, the Independent Budget Office, the Controller, the Health and Hospitals Corporation, and the public. The public will be invited to testify at approximately 4 p.m. on Thursday. For any member of the public who wishes to testify but cannot make it to the hearing, you can email your testimony to the Finance Division at financetestimony at council.nyc.gov, and the staff will make it a part of the official record. Thank you, and this hearing is now adjourned.